Well, good morning and welcome to the third meeting of the General Obligation Bond Arts and Culture Subcommittee. I hereby call this meeting to order. And we do have interpreters today to provide Spanish translation. Would you please introduce yourselves? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, my name is Mario Barajas, and together with my colleague, Carmen Cota, we will be serving as today's interpreters. I'll now introduce myself to our Spanish-speaking audience. Hola, buenos días, mi nombre es Mario Barajas, y junto con mi colega, Carmen Cota, estaremos sirviéndoles como intérpretes para la junta de esta mañana. Les pedimos como favor, si es que van a estar dando un comentario público, les pedimos de que hablen lentamente y claramente. De esa manera podemos interpretarle lo que usted, lo que usted diciendo de la manera más completa y precisa posible. Gracias. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Before we move into item number one on the agenda, I wanted to note that there will be a public comment period during item three of today's agenda. I'm planning to reserve at least 30 minutes for public comments, but we'll decide the duration and time limit for each speaker based on the available time we have at that point, the number of individuals registered to speak. Um, and, and I'll say this throughout today's meeting, our, our hope and our, our goal is to have as much time for the subcommittee to be able to discuss uh, the items that we would like to uh, begin thinking about putting forward for uh, recommendations. So hoping to, again, reserve as much time for our subcommittee today to have that that discussion. If you are attending in person and would like to speak, you'll need to sign up at the kiosk located at the entrance to council chambers before the call to the public item begins. And if you are attending virtually and would like to speak at a future geo bond committee meeting, please note you will need to register at least two hours prior to the start of the meeting. And you may register to speak at phoenix.gov slash bond slash meetings. Okay, our first agenda item is to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Any questions, discussion, corrections? Hearing none? Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Minutes are approved. Moving on to agenda item number two. Well, the main task for today's meeting is to identify the complete list of projects that the subcommittee wishes to, uh, wishes to prioritize. And if we can establish that list today, that leaves our final meeting, which is scheduled for Friday, September 30th, to agree on a rank order recommendation to put forward to the executive committee. And I did want to take just a minute to recap uh, what we have accomplished at our first two meetings knowing that this is meeting three of four, again, what we hope to accomplish today and then at meeting four to, to level set um, for today's conversation. So meeting number one, we received presentations from staff on what they recommended as projects for the, the critical needs study that we all, of course, have received copies of and is available uh, for public viewing as well. At that first meeting, we received those presentations, had a chance to ask questions, and then allowed plenty of time for public comment because we knew that there uh, were also potential projects from the community that would be brought forward. Uh, out of respect for both staff's recommendations and their, their expertise, we also have great respect for the public comment um, process and again allowing enough time for our members of the public to share what they think should be prioritized uh, through this process. Meeting number two, we received presentations on any follow-up requests that we had, uh, any new projects, again, that came forward from the community that we wanted to learn more about, and again, left uh, significant time for comments from the public to, again, bring forward potential new projects, share their support of uh, staff recommendations and or new projects that have been brought forward by the community. That brings us to today. And again, we do have presentations from staff based on our request from our last meeting, whether it's follow-up items, uh, staff will certainly detail uh, their presentation for us today. We will have time again for public comment, uh, but our, my, my hope for today again, as we're walking the steps of this process, is that if there is public comment, we're hearing any new information and or I should say any new information about um, projects that we've already received public comment about or again staff presentations about um, or if there is a new project that still wants to come forward of course we will hear that today but again really hoping to be able to use a majority of our time to begin discussions as a subcommittee 
because we do have uh, big tasks ahead of us, which we all know is a very important assignment. With that, I'm going to move us along to item number three, which is presentation from staff on the additional information requested, again, by the subcommittee. And then following the presentation, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions, um, engage in discussion before we then hear uh, public comment. Alan Stevenson, I'll turn it over to you next. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm Alan Stevenson filling in for uh, Inger Erickson uh, as the city manager's office representative. Uh, I'm joined here uh, with uh, Ms. Cynthia Aguilar, the parks uh, department director, uh, as well as Mitch Menchaca, who is our arts uh, director. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mitch to start our presentation. Thank you. Well, good morning, members of the subcommittee. I first wanted to take the time to thank you for your thoughtfulness and questions over the past two meetings. As we continue down this process, we are to the middle point for the subcommittee. Um, I also wanted to take some time to remind you of the prioritized capital needs that were put forward by the departments, um, as well as the future capital needs and the proposed projects by our community partners. And here are the prioritized capital needs of the Children's Museum of Phoenix Expansion, the original scope at 1.5 million, the Latino Cultural Center at 21.7 million, the Office of Arts and Culture's Facilities Critical Maintenance at 10 million, Valley Youth Theater's Permanent Home at 14 million, and the Symphony Hall Theatrical Venue Improvements at 8.6. Our future capital needs included the Arizona Jewish Historical Society expansion at $2 million, the Herberger Theater Center theatrical improvements at $5.3, the Children's Museum of Phoenix expansion um, kicks off our proposed capital projects with an updated scope of $5.3 million, the Herberger Theater Center's pavilion stage at $4.5 million, the Phoenix Center for the Arts Repairs and Repainting project at $8 million, and the Phoenix Theater Company ADA project at $5.8 million. The subcommittee and its leadership had questions or requested more information or clarifications on the following projects, including the Children's Museum of Phoenix expansion projects, the Phoenix Center for the Arts Operating Agreement, Valley Youth Theater's lease terms and the ASU IGA intergovernmental agreement, the Office of Arts and Culture's facilities critical maintenance list, the Herberger Theater Center's theatrical improvements, which was a future needs that was not discussed in the original presentation, and then an overview of the ADA program from the Neighborhood and City Services Subcommittee. So the Children's Museum of Phoenix project, again, was to add additional square feet in usable space by completing previously unfinished spaces in the museum. The project will increase exhibit and programming space to expand the operating capacity to serve children and more families. In the um, review of projects, there may have been a misconception of the scope of the project. The museum does indeed have 17,000 square feet of um, vacant space. The department put in um, for renovating 9,000 square feet, which are four rooms on the second and third floors of the building for exhibit space, guest experiences, and museum offices. The basement was not included in the department's submission as it was looked at storage and not for the public use or the benefit. So that proposed cost came at $1.5 million and was generated by our facility condition assessment. The new scope again proposed by the museum includes 11 rooms, including full renovation of the second and third floor, as well as the basement level, which is again is currently used for storage and office space. The other, the new scope proposed by the museum um, will update those seven rooms as a mix of storage, updated offices, staff break rooms, restrooms, as well as potential programming space in the basement. The revised cost provided by the museum is $5.3 million, a difference of $3.8 million to again renovate all 17,000 square feet. The difference in cost from the city's assessment and the museum's quote for just the original four rooms, again that 9,000 square feet, is a difference of $305,000. So when we think about prioritizing, if you prioritize the Children's Museum, you have a bevy of options to choose from. There is the full renovation at $5.3 million. Again, the full 17,000 square feet. There's the $1.8 million, which would be the new scope of the four rooms using the museum's Ryan quote. There's 
actually adding in the dirt room, um, which the facility conditions assessment only took into account um, shoring that space for a structural sounding of the second floor, but this additional money would renovate that room. Um, I think there's 2,700 square feet of dirt. Um, and then there's the original scope of the four rooms. So when making a decision based off this one, you do have choices from the original scope all the way to the $5.3 million. And I'm happy to, um, this morning we learned that there's also on the second and third floor as it comes into pricing, there's offices adjacent to the rooms that have been proposed for renovation on the second and third floor. And so things would have to be moved around, offices would have to be moved because that office would have to be, become public space to make these rooms usable. So with the information um, of all of this, if we had had it in January, we would have, the department would have presented the $5.3 million to redo the 17,000 square feet. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, we do have um, museum representatives here with us today. Would you prefer questions be asked after each uh, project presentation or at the end of your full presentation? Um, probably after each section because we do have um, guest speakers <laughs> here today. Staff leadership with us today. Excellent. I have a question. Please. Thanks, Mitch, for doing that. Um, so you're going with the 1.8 million, which was the figure provided by the Children's Museum for the actual cost of the the four rooms, that's what you're, you're doing. So is it true that to include the rest of the space, which as I understand from the notes that I received, that the remaining um, space that was not in the original scope of work would cost over $3 million, is that correct, correct. to, 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 to renovate? Room. And those are for essentially non-public spaces. You're saying it's, it, it just seems really odd to me that the public spaces would only cost 1.8 million, but the non-public storage spaces uh, and office spaces would be over $3 million. I just, I, that's amazing <laughs> that it would be that much of a difference. What, how do you account for that kind of, of difference, that much more for non-public spaces versus public spaces? So to get the certificate of occupancy um, for those second and third floors, that 1.8 is just turning into white box readiness. So it's no frills, it's just a nice new um, space. Although in both our assessment and with the Ryan Group, there will be needs that need to happen in that dirt room, but the dirt room to renovate it completely is over a million dollars. And so that's what makes up a big chunk of that basement cost. Um, and if you've been to the basement at the Children's Museum, it's a nice storage space with some office areas, but it's definitely not a space that you would want to bring the public if you did um, use it for public space. And there is plans for a workshop room and another set of restrooms in that space as well. So those are more those are more public spaces within that basement space. Correct. Okay, and I I would like to ask since Kate Wells is here, if there's anything else that she might like to add to this discussion or you know, further information, if she has it, would be very helpful in our making a determination of funding. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Does that work? Yes. Yep. Great. Um, yes, so to clarify, um, when we use the word rooms, we're using that lightly because it's a voluminous space and right now there are partitions in it. We, um, we count that there are 11 spaces, um, while some of them are definitely rooms. Um, some of the basement space is, is just kind of a meandering series of spaces. Um, of the 11 rooms that, rooms that we um, are proposing, eight of them would be for public use. Um, and I provided in that first, um, at the last meeting, there was a packet I provided, rooms one, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 will all be used for public spaces. Um, there is some um, support space um, that we need because we'd be bringing on, you know, literally 
eight new spaces and 17,000 square feet. So, you know, we're hoping that the committee realizes that to support that kind of growth, we're going to have to do some combining up of additional storage spaces to make it more efficient so that we can move out of, well, we've, we've spread out a bit at the museum because we have, you know, these unusable spaces. Um, but the storage space altogether is, um, you know, is a, a small percentage, is less than a third of the space total of storage, um, or actually in less than that even. I'm sorry, I don't have the number in front of me. Um, but um, 11, or, or many of the rooms will be used for public space because the basement space which you currently use for storage would be used for public space if we were able to renovate it. Does that make sense? Good morning, Kate. Just for clarification, that $5.3 million, which is the full renovation, you just stated that it's nine rooms plus the dirt. Eleven room. rooms. Eleven rooms. Eleven spaces. Eleven uh -huh. spaces, the dirt The room, dirt room. And the basement. The dirt room's included in that. Is in the basement, okay. Yes, so there's 11 spaces all together, including the dirt room. Um, I know it's, and, um, and eight of those will be used for public space. Thank you. Before I ask if there are additional questions, a quick statement in that staff did provide any hard copy handouts that were brought to the last meeting to the committee uh, via email far in advance of today's meeting or providing us enough time to review uh, for today's meeting. And we also received the hard copies of any that did not make their way to us at the last meeting and just wanted to make sure that was clear. Um, so we do have all the materials in front of us. Any other questions for staff or? So Kate really Wells? quick to clarify, I just found my numbers. Um, 4,347 square feet are um, our first our storage space. And when, I, when we renovate those, I mean, the, the total cost of that is only $108,000 to renovate over 4,000 square feet of space. So it's not like we're making them, you know, really nice storage rooms. This is to have basic electric, um, um, some HVAC, because the space is not air conditioned, um, doors, drywall. It's a very, very white box space for a small amount of money in comparison to the um, public space that needs more love. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for that presentation, and I think we are ready to move on. All right. Well, I would like to um, welcome Cynthia Aguilar, Parks and Recreation Director, to present on the Phoenix Center for the Arts Operating Agreement and then answer any questions for the subcommittee. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. As Mitch said, I'm Cynthia Aguilar, Parks and Recreation Director, uh, here to provide an overview on the Parks and Recreation Department's operating agreement with the Phoenix Center for the Arts. I will begin my presentation with a very brief overview about the property itself. Uh, this shoto foes an aerial view of the property, which is part of Margaret T. Hance Park. Just like the park, these buildings are owned by the Arizona Department of Transportation. The Parks Department entered into an agreement with ADOT to develop the park in 1988, and then in 1991, we entered into a lease agreement for use of the Performing Arts Center buildings. In 1995, we then entered into our initial agreement with the Phoenix Center Association to deliver arts and culture related programs and activities in partnership with the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, per, I'll just give you some information on our current agreement with the Phoenix Center for the Arts. Uh, the current term uh, ends in 2027, so it's a 10-year operating agreement, uh, and the operator has use of the premises uh, to help provide the public with a variety of educational and uh, cultural experiences. This slide shows some of the general items the City of Phoenix is responsible for. Some examples of these responsibilities include uh, exterior landscaping to the surrounding grounds and maintenance, uh, and repair and replacement of things that are typical that a landlord would be responsible for, such as doors, windows, roofs, flooring, and HVAC. 
This slide is intended to show generally the responsibilities of our partner, the Phoenix Center for the Arts, uh, which includes things like maintenance, repair, and replacement, of uh, things that would ultimately be needed to run the facility like an arts center, uh, specialty lighting, theater seating, any upgraded uh, or special sound systems needed, and improvements, again, related specifically to operating an arts center. We have taken the time to review the original proposal uh, you received from the Phoenix Center for the Arts, which originally, again, totaled over $13.5 million, noting a variety of interior renovations, renovations to the existing theater, and renovations to create a new theater uh, in the North Building, which I think we've learned or has been noted before that that building is a building that's currently been committed for another purpose and is not part of the operating agreement that we currently have with the Phoenix Center for the Arts. As we reviewed the items included in their proposal, uh, there are certainly a variety of things that we have, uh, we recognize are the responsibility of the city of the Phoenix, and there are certain things per our agreement that are the responsibility of our partner, Phoenix Center for the Arts. We have met with them multiple times recently, uh, and the things that you see on the top under City of Phoenix uh, responsibilities are the things that we have mutually uh, agreed are part of our responsibilities that are critical needs, more immediate needs. Uh, and then, or I'm sorry, I'm getting confused. These are generally things that we've identified are our responsibility that are things that are in need currently, whether it's immediate or whether it's future. I'll get more into immediate needs in our next slide. Uh, the things that we feel are in the proposal you've received that are part of the Phoenix Center for the Arts responsibilities um, are things that you see in there, such as the theater seating, theatrical rigging, balcony and curtains, uh, special audio equipment and lighting, um, security fencing, um, and an advanced security system. So those are just some of the examples uh, that are in the proposal that are uh, their responsibility per the agreement. As far as next steps, uh, we have met with them multiple times again, and we have mutually agreed that there are definitely some more critical immediate uh, needs, things that quite honestly can't wait for the bond that need to be addressed now. Uh, these things are uh, replacement of the roof. We have certainly made repairs to the roof over many, many years because that's the repair that was necessary at the time. We did have an assessment completed recently uh, and the contractor has verified that a full replacement is now needed. Also recently, an electrical panel failed um, and that repair is in progress now. Uh, that controls uh, a room where there are kilns in the building, in the visual arts building. And lastly, there are damaged sections of flooring also in the visual arts building that we will be working to replace uh, within the facility. We project the cost for these immediate needs to be close to $200,000, and we've identified funding in the Parks and Recreation budget to address these things. So again, these are the items that we uh, and our partner have agreed are the most critical of needs. Um, our next step after addressing these needs is to continue to work with our partner to develop a plan to address things that we feel are more future capital needs that are both the city's responsibility and the responsibility of the Phoenix Center for the Arts. Um, as far as our assessment on future capital needs, the thing that we can see that is going to be needed as not immediate but in the near future uh, capital need would be replacement of uh, at least three of the HVAC units in the facility. So that's something we'll be looking to identify funding for within our operating budget as well. Uh, and then we, we certainly want to thank the Phoenix Center for the Arts for the continued partnership and recognize the importance of the types of arts and cultural programming, education activities that come out of the facility. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Madam Chair. I Question about the, the future uh, capital needs within this. Obviously, HVAC is particularly important in Phoenix. Is that something you're looking to include in the next budget cycle? Or is that two budget cycles down the road? I guess when you say near future, what does that mean? Sure. So the first thing that needs to happen is we need to work with our public works department to do an assessment of those units to determine what we think. We think they're reaching end of life, what that end of life is. And that's how we will identify the funding accordingly. Um, we have another source of funds, which is the Phoenix Parks and Preserve Initiative funds that we could also look to using uh, for this. So we're confident we'll be able to identify that funding 
in the, appro in the appropriate time that's needed based on the assessments of those HVAC units. And something I failed to say, also I know a discussion point that, uh, that has come up before is that there is a basement space that doesn't have air conditioning currently. Uh, that space, when the building was built, it was not intended to be used for space that would have HVAC. It was a storage facility. We now know it's become a space that's being programmed and used for programs. That facility or that part of the building itself would require um, duct work and quite a bit of extensive work to actually bring air conditioning to it. So that we've identified as a future need as well, and we'll be doing some more formal cost estimates to determine what that would cost. We think right now um, it could be close to $500,000 to do that kind of work, and that would be part of a future plan as well. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. The immediate needs are roof replacement for both of the buildings. Uh, also, there's an electrical panel uh, in one of the rooms that has gone out, and that repair is already in progress now. Also, there are rooms with flooring that, uh, that have significant damage and wall repairs that needs to be repaired. So those areas or those repairs would be repaired immediately. We would work with the Phoenix Center for the Arts on the timing to cause as minimal impact to their programs as possible. Um, but again, replacement of the roof, the electrical panel, which is being done, and then flooring and wall repairs from former water damage. I'm sorry, uh, subcommittee member, that, that is the near term. That so is the near that term. That is the near term. Thank you. Yes. So I have a quick question, just as a point of clarity. I've gone through all this. We started off with 13.5 million overall. So are we now at the point where understanding there's money already in place to fix the short-term needs, is there an ask? Is there an ask for the bond committee now for this project, seeing how everything is going to be addressed in the future and what the the city is responsible for versus what the tenant is responsible for. Sure, uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. So from the parks and recreation perspective, we do not see a need to ask for bond funds to address the immediate needs and the future needs that are the city's responsibility per our operating agreement. Um, I think we probably have the same question for Sandra. Bassett as CEO of the organization. Yeah, and Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, the proposal that the Phoenix Center for the Arts includes does have these things, but it also has expansions, um, enhancements that are in that $8 million proposal that uh, Sandra can speak to that was presented last time with the handout. I have a quick question before she begins. So the, the money that they're asking for are things that are required of them to provide much of it. Is that what I'm understanding from what you've presented? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. So again, we did go through and compare what the requests were. And so the things that we've identified are the things we would be responsible for contractually. And as Mitch mentioned, those other things would be additional things that are under their responsibility for upgrades, enhancements, or repair and replacement of things that are clearly listed in the contract as their responsibility. Well, given that 13 plus million dollar budget, do you know of that budget what, what percentage is their responsibility in terms of the way they've laid it out and what is the city's? Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, what I can say is when we looked at the contract, the immediate needs were about 200,000. The future needs we feel are anywhere, uh, again, that are our responsibility contractually between one and a half to two million dollars. Correct. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Can we go back, um, Cynthia? So on slide 16, it outlines the immediate needs, the three things that you're going to take care of for 200000 um, And I've heard your response around the other things that could be future. Are you saying on um, page 16 where it has fixed the seats, which are mostly all interior renovations, those are the things where the two point one million dollars needs to be figured out between parks and the city of um, in the Phoenix uh, 
Center sure. for the Arts. Yeah. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I caused confusion in the presentation. Slide 16 um, are things that are generally the responsibilities uh, of both parties that we tried to outline. Okay. Examples, things that come right out of the contract, if you will. Slide 17, um, which I put up now, are the things that we've mutually agreed are the most immediate things. That's the roof replacement, electrical panel, floor, and wall repairs. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Uh, this is actually a, a, a question related to how we're distinguishing between who's responsible for what in the agreement. I'm wondering if there are similar distinctions in the other projects that we're looking at here. Um, and Mitch, maybe this is a question for you, um, because it sort of seems like we're trying to peel apart what the bond committee may be funding versus what the city should be funding from other buckets. Um, and I'm wondering kind of if we're doing this here, should we be doing it for other projects as well if the tenants also have responsibilities that we may be funding out of the bond? Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, each tenant that the city has, whether it be managed by us, parks, or convention center, has an operating agreement that has these stipulations. And these are the things that um, we take care of on the day to day. The proposals here from our tenants are needs that are sort of out of our control, like Valley Youth Theater's property is going to go away, so therefore we need the facility. Um, there is nowhere in the contract from either party in the Children's Museum about empty space. So those enhancements are sort of in this other place that are outside of the operating agreement. Um, so in our pieces, it's a little bit different than um, I think the Phoenix Center for the Arts, um, where the operating agreement came into question by the subcommittee. So these enhancements that we have put forward and the community have put forward are things that are outside of the operating agreements for our tenants. I'm, I'm curious, too, about your own bond process in the Parks Department. Did you consider the Phoenix Center for the Arts and decided that it was not didn't have enough critical needs to be part of the bond program at this juncture? And were you surprised that the Phoenix Center for the Arts came to another subcommittee to ask for the funds? And I don't know if there's a precedent for that. I know that none of the money has been expended and it's all one big pot at this juncture. But we each have, in our specific area, a limited number of funds to spend for the, in the organizations and projects that, are, that fall within our purview. So I just, I'm not sure how this happened and whether or not there's a precedent. Has it happened in other instances where someone who's part of another department comes to another bond committee and asks for that money from them? Sure, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, um, and I don't know if Alan would like to add, but there have certainly been other situations that I've seen where groups have uh, come to two subcommittees, if you will. Um, you know, uh, the projects that were identified for the Parks and Recreation Bond projects were those projects within the parameters we were given uh, to that were the most critical for us at the time uh, for a variety of reasons, and so that's why the Phoenix Center was not included, it was not intentional, or it didn't mean that they were not important, or that these repairs were not important. Uh, but again, it's just the need is so great, and we had to do quite a bit of balancing uh, for needs throughout the city in all of the parks and recreation facilities. So in our priorities, we have improvements um, similar and greater to these in some of our recreation centers um, in South Phoenix, North Phoenix. Uh, we have some new parks. We have pool renovations in Central City and Maryvale. And again, the grade was just, the, the need was just so great um, that it was not included in our current bonds proposals. Madam Chair, members of the, the subcommittee, if I could uh, just add to, for example, uh, the Phoenix Theater ADA uh, request that they presented to you, they also went and presented to the City Neighborhood Services uh, Bond Subcommittee as well. So it, it is happening in, in multiple places uh, as uh, outside entities are, are approaching the different bond you know, subcommittees to try and make their case for inclusion. And may I just make one distinction, uh, Madam Chair and the members of the subcommittee. In the 2000, 1999, 2001, and 2006 bond, um, it was an application-based project proposal. 
This was the departments coming through our CIPs and seeing what was critical and putting it forward. So if this had been 2006, the Phoenix Center for the Arts, um, the Phoenix Theater would have turned in an application and then we would have probably distributed them to the committee. So this is a little bit of a different process than the one in 2006. Can we get your guidance on distributing? <laughs> You know, because we've been asked for the, the the full the full Monty here from Phoenix Theater, which we'll get to later. But it would be helpful to understand parameters and what is appropriate for uh, this committee to consider, and what other committees are going to be considered with regard to that. So I um, can give you thoughts, um, and that these projects are arts and culture. It's the same five hundred million dollars across. Um, all the channels, so um, I think that since these folks have made the most presentation, the most impact of presenting here, it's probably best for it to uh, stay within the arts and cultural bucket. I know that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Phoenix Center for the Arts did not get the same um, presentations in parks, nor did um, Phoenix Theater in the Neighborhood and City Services Subcommittee. They got to present as a public comment, but in this terms of depth, this is where um, it has been most heard. Well, is there any talk about actually having the next uh, operating agreement with arts and culture versus parks? I mean, if, if they're going to be part of arts and culture, then arts and culture needs to, to manage them, correct? We can work internally. Um, I will say that um, there, it's a bigger span because it is on parks property. Um, we are in touch with the different uh, tenants because the Office of Arts and Culture is also the grant maker to all of these organizations. Um, I think in the next bond cycle, hopefully, if we have one in five years, uh, it will be more of that application base where we would shepherd where these would go. So it's a little bit of a, a, a conundrum this year for you, but I think that because this impact arts and culture, I wouldn't look at it in terms of the department, but the overarching um, piece of we are partners with these facilities. So think about arts and culture, including these for bond, but they would still be the tenant of parks, just like the Herberger would be the tenant of the convention center. And if I, I could, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, one thing I would add that would um, add some complexity to this, doesn't mean it's impossible, is that the master lease between the city and ADOT is with the Parks Department for the entire property. It, it is, uh, again, not impossible to do what you're asking, but there are some complexities that are a little different, I believe, um, with this situation than maybe some of the other organizations in Mitch's portfolio. But Parks actually is responsible, responsible fiscally for some of the things that are included in their proposal. So is there going to be, yes. I mean, is Parks going to be giving money to the Arts and Culture Department to cover some? I mean, I, I just, I'm not sure I understand the fairness of this. Sure, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, that's a good question. The funding would come um, entirely from the Parks Department for these repairs. So the immediate needs, the future needs, and just like any of the repair work over the years since we've owned the building from the 90s, that has always come from the, uh, from the Parks Department's budget. Right, but the, but the bond money, if we were to give them bond money, some of the bond money are actually for things that are supposed to be covered in your operating agreement. So that's what I'm wondering. I, you know, I know there's bond money and there's operating money, but I, I just want it to be fair for the Arts and Culture Department because there's a much, much more limited budget for arts and culture and if it's going to be sort of passed on to arts and culture to take care of I just don't think that's quite fair. Sure and, and one thing to clarify the the things that are the city's responsibility um, are the things we will be taking care of and then ultimately it would be up to the bond you know subcommittee to determine um, if you feel like the other things that are outside of our contractual responsibility um, upgrades enhancements things like that um, that again are under their contract is something that you know you feel is a priority project. And the payments, if selected, would go to the organization, not to the departments for the theater seating, those kinds of things. So it would go to the organization. I'm just trying to watch out for you, Mitch. I appreciate <laughs> it. Two quick questions for clarification purposes. You mentioned CIPs. 
oh yeah, capital improvement program. Perfect, just wanted to make sure everyone knew what that stood for. And you mentioned at other subcommittees, they have not asked for those in-depth presentations. And what I'm hearing you say is that the subcommittees have not expressed an interest or a desire to learn more about these potential requests that have come from the community. Sure, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. On Monday um, is the Parks and Recreation uh, Bond subcommittee meeting. That'll be their third uh, meeting. And so the Phoenix Center for the Arts uh, was present at the second meeting. As a result, they've also asked for a similar presentation on a few additional organizations, and the Phoenix Center for the Arts is one of them. So we've been asking Sandra to stand here for quite a <laughs> while. Um, these are excellent questions, and I think the question that we want to get back to is based on your conversations, your discussions recently around the partnership, who's responsible for what, what the city's idea identified as those immediate needs and under your responsibilities. I think what we're wondering is now is a, re a revised ask of us to consider for the Phoenix Center for the Arts. And I know, Sandra, you have an answer to that. And the answer would be no. And the reason why simply is because we appreciate the relationship um, and the identification of the issues as presented to City Parks and Rec as we're working to resolve them, our concern remains the same. It seems as if at this point we're going back and forth as to who to make the ask to, and we've been asking in the process for this. The additional concern is stated on page six, of course, of our Parks and Recreation um, contract. It does clearly outline what the city is responsible for on page six, carrying over to page seven, letters A through through M. Additionally, on page seven, it states that the operator shall be responsible to maintain. It does not state that we are to repair. It does not state that we are to go into financial difficulty to try to continue to operate, but it states that we are responsible to maintain fixtures or equipment that are used for operating the arts center, which we can no longer do because these items are outdated. In regards to the conversation we've had, and we're so very pleased that they are going to redo the roof. Um, the flooring that is initially being done is only being done in the rooms that have been adversely affected and are no longer able to be fully utilized because of the continuing and deferred damage. We are excited that we have an opportunity to outline when some of these additional repairs may occur, but our concern remains the same that since 1997, they have not yet occurred and we've received no further clarification as to a time frame or consideration as to when the rest of the repairs would occur. So right now, the floors that are looking to be repaired are in the rooms that have suffered heavy water damage from the continued deferred men, and I believe that's about four rooms. It doesn't take care of the hallways that have been damaged or have not been repaired that we have Marley floors placed on. You have the presentations. So my concern gets to be the same. Um, I was told coming into this meeting today that we were parts of arts and culture, so we may not have had to present again to Parks and Rec. Upon hearing this conversation, I'm once again concerned that we have to go back to Parks and Rec, and is this going to continue to go back and forth regarding understanding when this will be done? A future plan? I'm not sure when that may occur, because it hasn't occurred since 1997. We haven't received definitive dates as to when the rest of the repairs to keep us operational will occur. So my original ask remains. However, let me provide some additional clarification. 13 million included our ask for the North Building, which is currently not in play, but I wanted it on record that since we've been asking to be a participant in this space for a very long time, and if, in tr if it's true, the Latino Cultural Community Center has moved someplace else, this building will be back in play again. So that took us down to 8 million. Out of that 8 million, we're looking at building renovations to continue to be functional. $766,500 was asked for um, in terms of uh, being able to update the specialty lighting, the rigging, um, and some of the other equipment that we need to be able to operate within um, our parameters that we've been given by the city as our arts and cultural organization. So that ask of 766,500 remains. The rest of the building repairs still need to be addressed by somebody, and I was told that was going to be arts and culture. Make sure we are crystal clear in terms of the full amount that is still yes, being requested.
requested. Um, do you have the total? I know you just broke it out for us. Eight million six hundred thousand and six eight eight million six hundred sixty thousand and some change okay. that you have within the last proposal that I submitted. Seven hundred sixty six thousand five hundred dollars again was allocated and asked for for the theater updates. So we can simply remain functional. This is not an enhancement. I'm confused because I understand. I'm not sure what is the responsibility of your organization to provide and what is the city's. I mean, I'm hearing very different things from the two of you. So I don't, it's really difficult to make any kind of determination if you're saying that they're responsible for the, the, the curtains, the lighting, the seating, the, um, you know, the sort of interior stuff um, that helps them run a theater. And they're saying, that they wanted in the bond program. And I don't know, you know, I know that certain the, the Jewish Historical Society, they're raising money to, to in complete the interior. The Children's Museum is raising money to complete the interior. Are there any requirements within the bond program for the completion of the interior by any of your tenants? Uh, I mean, for this tenant in particular. No, um, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, and so all of you're right. Most of our partners all do fundraising to help with improvements that are uh, that are needed. As far as a requirement, there's there's not one currently um, specific to that. Not in our agreement that requires fundraising uh, or anything like that. Um, the Phoenix Center for the Arts. Um, thankfully does not have a monthly rent payment. They don't pay rent, they pay 50% of their utilities. That's the financial responsibility in the agreement. Um, we did review our responsibilities and their responsibilities with our attorney, Patty Bolin, um, who agreed with our assessment of who is responsible for what. So that is um, where some of my information comes from. Um, we can certainly go through the contract together. Um, you know, on, to me, and, and again, to our attorney on page seven, it says the operator is responsible um, to maintain fixtures or equipment um, that, again, are used, specialty lighting, theatrical rigging. There's some very specific language. Some of that language was taken out of the contract and put directly on the slides. But because we um, did not want to be unclear or unsure, we did review it um, with Patty Bowen to confirm. Okay, the floors. Whose responsibility is the floors? Because I understand there's a huge problem with the floors. Whose responsibility is that? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, flooring is our responsibility. They only have a maintenance responsibility, waxing, sealing, those kinds of things. That is our responsibility. Okay, so the $200,000 of critical need that you're planning on expending, does that, in that does not include floors? A portion, a small portion of the flooring um, that has the most significant water damage is in the immediate needs. As a future need, there are other areas in the facility that are need of floor replacement, that is part of the one and a half to two million in future capital needs that we will be addressing. Okay, and I'm wondering what percentage of the eight point, essentially one million dollars that is in here is actually re the responsibility in terms of contractually for you all to cover? And is this, you know, I, I, I don't, we're, we're trying to understand how much we, we have a limited amount of money, how much we could possibly give um, that is not your, I mean, that is, is the responsibility of the city and not the responsibility of your yes. organization. Um, being informed of this one to two million at this time, I have not seen what they've identified in the areas of the scope um, for replacement and the time frame again. But you will see in the information that I have provided in the scope, it does break it down according to the interior, exterior areas of our buildings, and it does add up again to the eight million. So what I can do um, is to go back and walk you through. So if you look at our scope, our Phoenix Center for the Arts studio spaces and replacing the lighting, the finishes, the flooring and soundproofing and to raise the, um, replace the windows and interior doors, that comes out for an area of 8,000 square feet of $1,100,000 For our visual art building studio spaces to do the same, that renovation or updating and replacement of 10,000 square feet comes out to $1,400,000. And our PCA office gallery and conference rooms again to do the same um, for 3,600 square feet comes out to $504,000. 
when we go over to the next page of the scope that I've included in the previous presentations as well as this one, we can address the PCA hallways. And when we look at the lighting, the finishes, the flooring, replacing ceiling tile and ensuring the hallways meet modern code requirements as far as not being damaged for tripping areas, 1,200 square feet comes out to $120,000. The hallways at our visual arts building, again, just for the basic updating and replacement of things long deferred for 3,000 square feet feet comes to $300,000 to make sure that our restrooms are completely functional and up to code as far as low flow water devices and things of that sort. For 2,000 square feet, that comes out to $240,000. Regarding our visual arts building, again, for the same thing, 3,000 square feet at $300,000. I will not discuss the uh, uh, optional of doing a roof because that's 90,000 and not included in the main scope of the consideration. And then when we look at the theater, um, as far as the green room, we're just talking about doing some plumbing, um, making it a little bit more compliant in the restrooms. That came out to about 144,000. The main theater lobby, 60,000 as far as updating the floors, replacing the flooring and things of that sort as well. Again, $766,500 was allocated for rigging and things of that sort. So this information has been provided to the city and um, that is the scope of what needs to be done. This is not an enhancement. This is just to make sure it's functional. Here if I may suggest a recommendation uh, by the end of today's meeting and we'll hear from staff in a little bit on a survey tool that they recommend but by the end of today's meeting we want to identify the projects that we want on that list for us to determine again what projects we think should be recommended we're not determining amounts today um, or the prior or the rank order of those projects between today's meeting and our fourth meeting uh, it would be my recommendation that Phoenix Center for the Arts and staff meet again to determine from that scope uh, what is critical, what can be covered through other budgets, what cannot be covered through other budgets, because that to me is the amount that should be brought forward to this subcommittee at our fourth meeting as that final amount. Is that a fair, fair request? Chair, can I add yes. one caveat to that? Um, it's not just critical, but also the future identified needs. I know there was like a one and a half to two million dollar estimate that was thrown out here. Um, basically, what is it going to cost for the city to tackle all of the floors, for example, rather than doing it in a piecemeal fashion, sort of peeling apart the city responsibilities for in total, if that makes sense? Madam Chair, mm -hmm. it, it also seems we're having a theological debate over the meaning of maintenance. Uh, the uh, city claims that maintenance is your responsibility. Uh, I, I'm not sure how that works. If you have a rotting floor, uh, is that a maintenance repair or a rotting floor? Uh, and that's where it becomes a theological debate. And I think that ultimately, uh, like it or not, we're going to have to choose sides. Uh, here, because I think that the the attempt to dispense with the responsibility by relying on the word maintenance is uh, is flimsy, frankly, and uh, and I know what side I'm going to choose because I don't think that uh, this kind of theological debate is is appropriate. It's the floor's got to be repaired. And that's what we should be talking about. To Thank answer you, your question, sir. if I may, on page six of the contract, it states the city of Phoenix shall maintain, repair, and replace, if necessary, at its own expense on a continual basis as budget allows those common building fixture, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, which includes doors, windows, roofs, electrical distribution systems, systems, all floors and all floor coverings, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems, automated energy management system, plumbing system, and restroom fixtures, fire alarm systems, interior lights, exterior lights, and parking lot lights, irrigation sprinkler and drip systems, exterior fencing and gates, basic interior security system, internet and telephone connectivity to the buildings only. And then it has a paragraph there regarding what the operator shall be responsible to maintain. I hope that answers your question and again is stated in our contract on page six. 
Ma'am and Madam Chair, Chair members of the subcommittee, what I'd, what I'd like to add to that is um, that is correct, what Sandra read, and that's what was reflected on our slide and the information we shared. We've acknowledged those are our responsibilities. Well, it just, Madam Chair, it just seems to me where your uh, interpretation or definition of the word maintenance is substantially more expansive uh, than the uh, uh, City Parks Department. Uh, and, and that's why we're ultimately going to have to choose sides here. I don't think we're going to be in a position uh, to decide where maintenance begins or where it ends. And I hope by September 30th we will not have to choose sides. I think we'll have to choose sides well, in a number of these things. These two partners have uh, a few days to get back together to determine uh, what is considered maintenance, what is considered repair. They have made progress up until this point, and we will look forward to receiving those numbers at our fourth meeting, and hopefully it is mutually agreed upon what is critical, what can be covered by the city now through other budget, what is critical that cannot be, that should be put forward as an ask for this bond program. I, I'm sure you're, you're just more uh, optimistic than I have. They've been talking since 1997. Um, that would seem to me enough time to have worked out a definition of maintenance, but apparently not. Uh, but the, I, you know, you shouldn't get depressed by that. Biblical scholars are still trying to work out any number of words. So. I remain hopeful. We have an excellent relationship with Parks and Rec. Um, and we appreciate the partnership that we've shared, and we also appreciate the partnership with arts and culture, and I know that we will be able to make a determination as to which path is going to be the best for everybody involved, especially the over 35,000 people we serve annually within that park at the Phoenix Center for the Arts Campus. I thank you all in the subcommittee for your consideration and your time. I thank Parks and Rec, and I thank Arts and Culture for the opportunity to participate in this process to a successful resolution. Excellent. Thank you. I would like to move on at this point. I know we have other presentations. We want to make sure other projects receive uh, time as well, especially the Herberger Theater Center, because we actually have not received a presentation on it that we, again, just want to make sure we're still remembering that that's an item for us to consider. Um, so, Mitch, I'll turn it back to you. Well, we will now discuss Valley Youth Theater's lease as it relates to the intergovernmental agreement the city has with Arizona State University. My colleague, Chris Mackey, Community and Economic Development Director, is here to answer any questions and fact check my presentation. <laughs> so again, Valley Youth Theater was founded in 1989. In 2001, it purchased a property at 525 West North Street to provide performance and rehearsal space for productions and workshops. The theater is a 202-seat venue. They produce over 150 productions since they've moved in. And the current building is included in the ASU master lease that will eventually displace the theater. Again, the project that is put forward here is to locate a new site and design a, and construct a new facility for Valley Youth Theater that will be their permanent home. That project cost is $14 million. In 2001, again, they uh, had go bond funds to purchase the property at 525 North 1st Street. The agreement with Valley Youth Theater ends on January 5th, 2030. May 11, 2005, the intergovernmental agreement with the city and ASU was created for the development of the downtown Phoenix ASU campus. In, two, in May 2006, the city authorized a master lease and operating agreement with ASU, including ASU's requirement to begin development planning activities of the VYT site by August 1st, 2022. In June 15, 2022, the city amended that master lease to modify and extend certain terms, including ASU's deadline for the initial development period on the VYT lot to January 5, 2030. The question has arisen, why fund this project in this bond cycle? ASU may, may take possession of the site sooner than 2030, but even if it waits, VYT needs the capital to relocate and continue its mission, which the timing falls into this bond cycle. The current operating agreement between the city and VYT does state that if the city terminates the agreement and the theater is not in default, then the city will provide VYT with a comparable facility in size, scope, function, and amenities as determined by the city. 
That clause was passed on to ASU in the intergovernmental agreement if ASU takes possession of the building before VYT's lease ends on January 5th, 2030. And again, I'm happy to invite Chris Mackey to share information that I might have left out or um, answer subcommittee questions. As Chris makes her way to the table, our first question is, Chris, did he leave anything out? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, I think we're good. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I, Madam Chair, I think the first question here is, um, we have a $14 million ask in front of us. Um, do we have a site? I think I asked this in the first meeting, and. and uh, to me, it's certainly, you know, if they're city-owned property, that's terrific, but, you know, it's, I guess in my head it's a little difficult to get a true cost estimate without understanding what the site parameters are. Madam Chair, Committee Member Owens, if I might. Uh, Chris Mackey, I'm the Director of Economic Development here for the City of Phoenix, and my department oversees the property that is there. As we've worked with VYT for quite a number of years, I've had the privilege of working with them for eight years on exactly the conclusion we're working to come to today. Where would their new site be? What are their needs? What would the size of the site, those type of things. From the city standpoint, we would love to see them remain in downtown. We feel that they're a, a, a vibrant portion of the fabric of, of downtown. So we've looked at a number of sites. The city does have a number of sites that are under my department still. There's a number of privately owned sites. We've looked at those as, as we look. We know the size that we need. We've looked at things um, you know, from a parking standpoint and those type of things. So we do have three or four sites that we think would be a great fit here in downtown that are comparable in size to the, pro a, a little bit bigger, because it's a smaller building that they have today, but it, it would fit well with the size of facility that they're talking about today. Thank you. Well, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously we have no Walsh Brothers buildings a downtown I mean okay um, but are these buildings that that you're considering um, are they south of Jefferson in the warehouse district madam chair committee committee member Reiner, what we've been looking at we've looked at existing buildings existing older buildings that could be south of Jefferson they could be kind of north there were some that could be what we really have honed in on a little bit more are some vacant land sites that the city owns that could be rebuilt but but one or two of the properties is actually in the more northern area of downtown and what do you mean by northern area well a downtown ends at mcdowell by my definition okay so if that helps no i i take downtown a little further than that because yes, i live more north it, of mcdowell some but people I'm think it includes midtown and uptown as well <laughs> oh yeah um, except the newspaper. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm just, you know, trying trying to, to figure this out because my impression is that whatever site that you select should be close not only to light rail but to buses. And I think that that's essential um, both for uh, people who would attend but also for students who would uh, possibly be going there. Uh, to work and stuff like that so madam chair committee member Reiner, we could not agree with you more we think that's a critical opportunity is to be uh, have easy access to both okay thank you thank you does ASU have a financial obligation or uh, have they considered a contribution for for forcing uh, the move uh, madam chair members of the committee so as the, the lease was originally conceived of, as, as Mr. Machanga uh, stated, the city has an obligation if we relocate BYT prior to the end of their lease in 2030 to put them in a like-for-like -like building. It's an easy way to word, as, as he worded much more eloquently, I say like-for-like. -like. We pass that along to ASU. If, if we were not going through this process and ASU would have an obligation to relocate them into another building, that is like for like. Their building is a, a much different building today than what is being proposed 
as part of the bond process. It's a much smaller building. It's an older building, so they'd be responsible to replace something similar. I looked it up online. Now, mind you, I'm going to provide you details that are from the county assessor's website. I want to be, be clear, we've not performed an appraisal on the building. But if we look at what ASU would have to replace, if you're looking at the county assessor's site, it would be somewhere uh, around you know two to three million dollars. So it's a much less than the permanent home for VYT that we'd be looking for today. Um, as we look at, at opportunities and we look at, at VYT, should this committee choose to move this forward and should city council move it forward and should the citizens elect this to move forward in November of 2023, VYT understands completely that they would have a, a capital campaign that they would need to raise funds as well. This wouldn't be solely reliant on the $14 million request for the city. We also have had discussions with ASU about ASU having some obligation into, into that ultimate capital campaign in the future. We have no commitments from them, um, but we've had that discussion. Blackmail is good too in this instance. I, I'm really curious about the budget of 14 million. I really don't have any details about what that entails, and it seems pretty high to me personally. Um, can we have more information about what that entails? I mean, clearly it's land acquisition. Um, the, the, in 2001, when the Valley Youth Theater was given 1.5 million through the bond, uh, and the property, I guess, was purchased at that time, the, the current property, that was considered a permanent home as well. Um, so I guess in the future, whatever they build could be considered a temporary home like this one has been, correct? Madam Chair, Committee Member Freeman, when we look back to 2001 and, and Value Theater fitting into that permanent home in 2001, it was a much different organization than it is today. They've had tremendous success with their program, and I, I, I view that as a really fortunate thing. They've grown exponentially, they've produced some very talented actors out of their program and produced 150 shows during that time. And so if we look at, at 20 years ago to say that that was their home 20 years ago, would you hope that if this is approved and built forward 20 years from now, I think knowing what we know now, we would be looking for a site that an expansion could happen on the site. I think as we, we look back to where Value Theater is today, that was their plan, certainly not their fault. That was their plan to be able to expand on their existing site. Um, Mayor and Council in 2004, 2006 made the determination to bring Arizona State University into downtown Phoenix to help the revitalization of downtown along with a number of other things. And so that limited Valley Youth Theater's ability to expand on the existing site. So I think what we'd be looking for now is to, to you put so wisely that permanent home, could that not become their permanent home in the future? Um, the goal would be to, you know, we already have ASU down here, the city, we are now attracting things in downtown Phoenix we'd not visioned before, is to find them that permanent home that does have expansion opportunity so we wouldn't be saying that $14 million is going away and now we start all over again. In the future, 20 years from now, it might be for an expansion because we've produced other magnificent actors out of the facility. So we can get the budget. This is the fourth time I've asked for it. So, so um, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we have what the organization presented, just like the other tenants, from their architectural renderings that came up with the scope. And so we can get that information to you and I would request that if possible email between now and our next meeting and then we can certainly request a slide on that information at our, our next meeting as well and I also wanted to acknowledge that Bob Cooper is here so if anyone has any questions for uh, VYT he is here to answer them Donna um, the other question I would would want in those uh, that financial thing is what are you uh, proposing for I mean it's the 14 million only for the building and the plans. It's not for land acquisition. 
um, members of the subcommittee, that's correct. And in the um, capital needs study, there is a documentation that doesn't go into the devil of the details, but does show what funding would be used for, and land acquisition is not part of that um, because of these agreements with the city and ASU. Madam Chair, just one follow-up. I you know in the past in other presentations, Mitch, you've let us know if uh, partial funding is possible. Uh, just within this, you've mentioned we've heard capital campaign a couple times. Uh, is partial funding uh, even a possibility for something like this? Does that do anything for us? So we do have Bob Cooper from Valley Youth Theater here that could speak on um, what the organization has planned. Um, if given that $14 million, what that would cover and what the organization would need to contribute as well. So if I'm here. Oh, he's right there. Oh my God, you're yeah. here. Ta -da. I'm prepared. Uh, <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, city staff, everyone, thank you for giving us this opportunity. Thank you for your time. I had a prepared speech, but now I'm going to just address uh, the items that I've been listening to and just give you just quick as I can a little brief history. In 2001, when we, um, well, I'll back it up a little bit. In 1998, we lost our home in Tower Plaza Mall, a space that we had invested our dollars, dollars that we raised to build a 10,000 square foot space. But we lost that. We were supposed to be there in perpetuity, but we lost that to the development there. And we had to go and find space. We searched everywhere. I've, we've been in about every assembly space there was at that time in Phoenix. And we found that little building at the corner of First Street and Fillmore. We struck a deal because we're deal makers. We make things happen. And we invested uh, nearly three quarters of a million dollars of funds that we earned, we raised, uh, that we slaved on. I mean, I, I laid floors and, and drilled, hammer drilled things. I mean, it, it was a lot of work, but it was our money, our investment. And then in um, 2000, the bond process came because we had a vision of we to build a very expansive space to enhance our programs. Um, and this was an opportunity. So we presented in the bond to take and build a facility. During that process, they said, well, you've already invested all of this money in this building. Why would you want to move somewhere else? So we said, fine, we'll do it right here. And so that was to build that, take that building. And it was never an intention of just that building. It was the whole property. And so with that $1.5 million, my understanding was that that was purchased. The building was purchased for us, and the property was purchased for us. And we insisted that the property was included in the lease the entire time. So fast forward, between 2001 and 2006, we sat with city staffers many times and saying, it behooves us now that the voters voted for this, that we make this become a reality, that your permanent home is a reality. Because going into that little building, we went from 10,000 square feet to 7,000 square feet. So, but our, our programs were going like this, but our space went like this. So what did that mean? We had to lease uh, storage space. We had to lease office buildings. We had to invest a lot of our own money again into making sure that we could keep bringing the magic that is Valley Youth Theater to the community. In 2006, we went in that bond process. Ultimately, there are, others, there are other priorities. Not, not to me, <laughs> ours was a priority, but others didn't feel it was a priority. So here we are now, 16 years later, having these conversations, and it's, we have been living under the fact that our, our permanent space or our temporary space or our space could be pulled out from under us. But that doesn't stop us. We continue to raise money. So if there's money to be raised to supplement, we will work to raise that money. But we have a very big need and we don't want to have to worry any longer about losing our home. So in 20 years, I loved what Chris said, that it would be to expand and make it even greater. And I also have to say that we do have, you know, Academy Award winner, winning actresses and, you know, people in recording and, and television and film and Broadway. We have a number of kids I'm going to see right now on Broadway. I'm going to see Sam Premeg be the final Evan and Evan Hansen on Broadway. But we also have Professor Ch Chandra Crudup at ASU. We have Tyler Service, who's sitting right here. He's a police officer. He puts his life on the line each and every day. We have so many young people that we impact. And it's not just arts. We're here about the child. And we're here about the future. And I feel that this is so, so important. So that when we're all gone, that our children have had everything that they possibly could have. Even if it's in the arts, it balances a child. 
for their future and ours. Glad you did not wait until public comment to share that with us. Thank you. Well, I still have more. Oh, well, <laughs> well then we will not skip over your name at public comment unless you'd okay. like to share it now. You're more than welcome to. You know, it, it's the numbers. I mean, the reason we won a Dream Award in 1999, we were, a, a, we were one of the first kids on the block on the revitalization of downtown. It was a blighted area. It was scary. Uh, Caddy Corner over this way was a pawn shop. Right across the way over there was a, a place where, uh, what do you call it, a um, strip club. You know, there was a bar two doors down that was quite scary, but we had a vision, you know. And, um, but we, have, we bring children and families, tens of thousands of people downtown every year with our programs and our projects and the things that we do. We partner with other social service agencies, with arts organizations. We provide space and opportunity. So it's huge. It's, it's not just a couple of kids in a, in a, putting on a play and singing and dancing. It's making a major impact. And hundreds and hundreds of thousands of young people have been impacted, both on stage, backstage, in the audience, in our orchestras, on our tech crews, and in our programs that we provide. It's an, and I have to say, it, in my closing, I said an investment in value theater is a sound investment, and you won't, be, you won't be sorry. And I thank you so much for your consideration, your time. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions for, for Bob? Appreciate your words. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We will move on to the next presentation. All right. So the next is the Office of Arts and Culture Facility Maintenance, uh, moving from intrinsic to instrumental things. Um, these funds will address deferred maintenance and critical equipment replacements for seven of the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture's managed facilities, which include Arizona Opera, Ballet Arizona, Black Theater Troupe, the Children's Museum of Phoenix, Phoenix Art Museum, the Phoenix Theater Company, and Valley Youth Theater. These projects are less than $500,000, which was the threshold required to be in the bond. Items programmed in this fund are based on facility conditions assessment, and the GoBond request is $10 million. You were provided last night with a list of what those kinds of needs would be, and um, examples of these critical equipment would be replacement of the Arizona Opera's fire alarm and electronic systems, upgrade to ballet Arizona's electrical panels, replacement of Black Theater Troops HVAC systems, replacement of the Children's Museum of Phoenix's roof, replacement of the Phoenix Art Museum's entrance hardscapes. And I will say, these are things that are in our oper operating agreement that the city is responsible for for these properties. Happy to answer any questions on these. I noticed with that list that it was more than $10 million. We had uh, proposed more than $10 million, <laughs> but this is what okay. came well, out. I and these are things that we um, will identify in um, our budget, but if we can uh, program it in the bond, um, then it does free up for regular maintenance that we do on these facilities um, annually. So it is a bigger request, but we prioritize per the fiscal year. So we okay. can... So we're going to hopefully... Um, do the thing is pay me now so I don't have to pay me so much more later. I mean, I think one of our, we, we're seeing that all this deferred maintenance is costing us a lot more money than it should be costing us. And um, I'm waiting for the city to do some bake sales because, you know, you might have to do that. I will do anything for a dollar for the art, so. <laughs> I go for dark chocolate, okay. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes, really please. Quick. Um, Mitch, what was the maintenance budget for arts and culture in the, uh, this fiscal year? Our um, cultural facilities fund is around $3 million, and that's for the different varieties of our operating agreements from um, utility payments to fire inspections um, to actually at Valley Youth Theater, uh, I did a tour and the bathrooms were not the greatest and so we just replaced those restrooms in that facility. Gotcha, and then does that fluctuate a ton from year to year or is it typically around three million? Um, I'm going to point out that sitting in front of you is Romeo Rabusa, our cultural facilities director who is 
a tap dancer when it comes to the budget. So we are given the same budget. We take care of the things that we need to, but we always try to work with the tenants at the end of the fiscal year to find out what other um, improvements or if there are things on that um, deferred list that we can take care of. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, if I may add, Chris Fazio from the Budget and Research Department. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to add the city also has a $13 million annual general fund budget for major maintenance. That budget's used to fund the most critical projects citywide. So when the Arts and Culture Department brought forward $14 million in cultural facilities needs, the reality is that $13 million per year would take too long to be able to absorb all of those costs. So that's what, what you've seen here is essentially the gap funding. Yep. So I'm uh, happy to introduce John Chan, uh, Convention Center Director, to discuss the Herberger Theater Center's theatrical improvements. It's on the future capital needs and was not discussed in our first or second meeting. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. Um, so the Herberger Theater Center improvements, as Mitch mentioned, under future projects, as we discussed in our first meeting, just a reminder, the Herberger Theater is a city-owned tenant operated facility. So in this project would consist of three uh, major components. The first would be to replace the lighting, uh, theatrical lighting in, uh, for center stage and for stage west. Uh, the current lighting is more than 20 years old, obsolete by industry standards. So this would replace it to state of the art, fully programmable LED uh, lighting. The second uh, component would be new audio control consoles, amplify amplifiers, and speakers. Uh, also, uh, due to the age of this uh, equipment, um, uh, replacement parts are very difficult to come by. Factory services are no longer available, so it's just more at risk of, of uh, you know, equipment breaking down. Then the third component of this project would be the replacement of the assistive lift listening system. So uh, that's another piece that needs to replace. Total cost of this project, 5.3 million. Uh, this is a city obligation per the terms of the operating agreement with the uh, Herberger Theater Center. And then, however, this is not currently programmed in the five-year capital improvement budget. Madam Chair, realistically for some of the, um, and I know a lot of facilities are going through this sort of upgrading of older systems right now, what is the expected sort of remaining life for some of these systems? Well, I, I, I would say, I, I guess the best way I could pro, uh, describe it is that they're approaching the end of its useful life. Um, so, you know, I think it's one of those things that we're going to need to address, you know, uh, eventually. And, uh, probably sooner rather than later. So it, it, this is not something that I could tell you we could kick it down the road for another 10 years or so. I'm, I'm curious. I, may, I, I think I didn't hear what you said in terms of the operating agreement that the city has with the Herberger Theater Center. Are the things that are listed in this $5.3 million request are those things that the city in that operating agreement would be providing, or are these things that... That, that, that is that, correct. That, okay. That's an obligation of the city. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. That's helpful. And I will point out Mark Metis is here, the uh, executive director of the Herberger Theater Center, in case anyone has any questions for Mark. There's a second project of the Herbert Theater Center, which I'm very somewhat confused about, um, which has come up since we were given these, uh, this listing. D is the Herbert Theater Center asking for two projects? Are they going to combine this to one project? Um, is this something that you, your department considered as part? I don't even know if you have a bond so, program. <laughs> um, so, Madam Chair, members so, of so, the subcommittee, the project that I just described for the replacement <clears throat> and upgrade of the of the lighting and audio equipment, that was a city staff recommended project as, as part of the facility maintenance uh, requirements. The, the stage project is, is an additional item that came through at the request of the Herberger Theater. Uh, Madam Chair, just to, to clarify, I'm sorry, this, the, this particular improvement we just were presented to about uh, is in the future capital needs section, not the uh, prioritized capital needs section? 
it's in the future capital needs of the bond study. So yes, it's something that felt could be addressed in a future bond cycle. Thank you. In the outdoor stage, the outdoor pavilion, it was a new project brought forward by the Herberger Theater Center for us to consider as a prioritized project. And right. Mark. During the initial conversations about uh, this project, the improvements to the interior, um, at that point, we were not aware that we could discuss any other projects other than what are the critical needs, what is breaking now, what are we having a hard time finding parts for, and so we talked about that. Then, when, we, when it became clear that we could put a new project forward, then we, as Phoenix Performing Arts Center, Inc., the, op the organization that operates the Herberger, brought this project for this stage forward. The original building and land was paid for with public and private funds, about half and half, between the nonprofit organization and the um, Civic Plaza Building Corporation Fund. That's how it was originally built, and then when we opened in 1989 by the agreement, the city took ownership of the land and the building, and we have a 60-year operating agreement for the theater plus a 60-year renewal. So. As we talk about the the stage project, we're talking about sharing the costs on that, just like we shared the cost for the building. But in terms of operating it, we would be taking on those operation costs of this new stage, just like we operate the theater itself. Any other questions? I know that the uh, Hans Park is going to have a world-class outdoor theater space. Mm -hmm. That's what's planned, is my understanding. Yeah. Is that something you all considered? I know it's not adjacent to you, but having a world-class outdoor theater space not very far away, I'm just trying to think of the budgets and, and uh, maximizing the impact. Yeah, that project over at Hans Park is much bigger. It's going to be bringing in uh, festivals for many thousands of people and uh, large national acts. What we're talking about is for s is smaller. Uh, the size of the, the east side of the land right now is much smaller than that, and we could only have three or 400 a absolute maximum over there. And we're really targeting uh, local community events and local community artists and giving them an opportunity to perform and audiences uh, the opportunity to come for those performances and other um, family fitness days and, and other community events that would all be free. You haven't thought about it possibly being, is it too large a space, is that what you're saying? Because there are outdoor spaces for fitness activities at the Hans Park too. I just need to understand why you, you would not consider using another outdoor space in theater, world class. Um, well, certainly we're open to all conversations, but in terms of what we set up during the pandemic, the stage adjacent to our building and being able to use some of the resources in the building um, in the heart of downtown, that's what we, that's success, that proof of concept, if you will, is what we're trying to build on with this project. I keep looking for uh, Deputy City Manager Ingrid Erickson to help answer that question, but I know she's not here today. Um, and I will disclose I'm a part of the, the fundraising effort for the Hans Park Revitalization Project. Um, Phoenix Community Alliance underneath the umbrella of Downtown Phoenix Inc. is part of the, the uh, partner coalition. So it is a public-private partnership working to raise funds to revitalize the park, and the stage is actually in phase three, of which is not even being fundraised for currently, so that would be a few years down the road. But it's a great question uh, as we think about downtown in totality. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's move on to the next. All right. Thank you, John. Um, finally, I would like to invite Joe Judice, Public Works Director, to discuss the ADA funds discussed in the Neighborhood and City Services Subcommittee and to, and to answer subcommittee questions. Good morning. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Joe Judice, Public Works Director. Uh, as I sat listening this morning, just want to uh, appreciate your volunteerism uh, in serving and the difficult decisions you have before you um, and to the executive committee. So uh, it's our understanding that uh, you wanted to have uh, a little update on the 
Americans with Disability Act program that is being considered at the Neighborhoods and City Services uh, Committee, which is meeting uh, this afternoon at 1. Oh, we're there. Okay, perfect. Uh, so the um, ADA compliance improvements projects, as is being considered by the Neighborhoods and City Services Committee, is a $10 million project funded at $2 million each year with an additional $100,000 in percent for arts contributions. The project is designed as a, pro or the program is designed uh, to address ADA needs that are identified throughout uh, a large number of city-owned facilities and properties. And it's being informed by, in, in 2000 and, in 2021, our um, Equal Opportunity Department began an uh, ADS, ADA assessment program in collaboration with our Public Works Department. And we have a third party that's going out and doing assessments. And that uh, those assessments, as they come back, will inform us on how to prioritize investments that are part of this program. Uh, the Neighborhoods and City Services Committee is not earmarking funds for any specific project. So it is our understanding that um, the, um, uh, what, what's, I'm sorry, the Phoenix Theater has come to this committee with a proposal for ADA improvements and it would be appropriate for this committee to um, evaluate that program and make determination as to uh, how you would want to handle that. And I can take any questions. Was the, that project in your list or did you somehow miss it, that it was a need in that building? Again, the the program that was submitted by the department was not specific projects. It was a recognition that we have since the 2010 update to the Americans with Disability Act. We have, and we have facilities throughout that haven't been updated in many years, as you know, through your conversations about deferred maintenance. And so there is a, uh, a need of investments in ADA throughout a number of city properties. We did not identify any specific project at this point. The ADA assessment that's being done by a third party is, is evaluating properties now and throughout the next several years and those identif identified needs will be prioritized for investment. So there is not a specific project that was looked at. So you're only asking for money without knowing how much you really need. Is yeah, we're, we're confident the need far outweighs even the $10 million okay. that are being asked for in the bond program, as is the case in many of, uh, e even as Mitch alluded to earlier, um, we have done a lot of facility assessments. The ADA is a very specialized assessment that's being performed in addition. Um, we, we are confident, so for example, at Neighborhoods and City Services, in our downtown facilities, we have uh, the facility condition assessments that um, also helped Mitch inform his projects that identified about $40 million in need and the bond program is for 10. And so it's not, you're all faced with the same challenges we're faced with, which is there hasn't been a bond program in a number of years. There's a lot of deferred need that remains to be addressed. We can't do it all in five years. And this is a great uh, start towards that. So when is this assessment supposed to be done? Because I think it weighs in making decisions as to whether we in the arts and culture should recommend that particular project to fall under here um, or say, no, you really need to go to neighborhood and city services because without that assessment and what you might deem as your prioritization, we've got the cart like 10 miles in front of the horse. Well, Madam Chair, uh, Member Reiner, if I, if I could add to this, um, I think that because the ADA uh, codes were updated in uh, 2010 and then I think 2013, there were some updates too, 
there are a number of needs, so we're not putting the cart before the horse. We're making sure that we can address needs that we already know are there. What the consultant is doing is going through and prioritizing what are the most critical to address from public service need uh, in terms of, of the public that is interacting in all the city buildings that, are, that the city owns throughout, which is how many buildings, Joe? We have 500 buildings or so? About 1,300. 1,300 buildings. So over that time period, there's a lot of need. So we're not putting the cart before the horse in that instance. We're trying to make sure that we put money aside through this bond because, again, it gets back to critical deferred maintenance that has happened because we haven't had a bond since 2006 of putting money in there for critical buildings. Really where they're interfacing with the public is what's going to likely come out of that study as the needs that need to be addressed first as part of this five-year effort. And so other needs uh, are going to likely be future ones down the road. And, you know, where, for example, if this was an ADA need that was facing the uh, front of house operations where the general public was walking in, that's going to be more of a critical need likely than something that is in the back of house that is not as impacting as much of the public. And so that's what the consultant is looking at, giving us recommendations, how to prioritize the money that we will get out of this, hopefully, to then move forward with it. However, it still leaves us in a lurch of, of decision making, because although this particular uh, project with the Phoenix Theater is more what we would say back in the back of the house. It impacts people, um, the actors, the employees, which to me seems to be a critical need. And so again, they have approached us, but should they have approached us? should they have really approached the other one. I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to say is that I think from the public's perspective, this particular chunk of money has been um, not clearly delineated as to what its purpose and what your process is and what you're going through, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, when's this, dis if we vote on this in November, I mean, I would assume that this study has already been done and approved, hopefully, um, so that you could prioritize who's going to get this 10.1 million if that's what you get. So, uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, uh, Ms. Reiner, it's not unlike uh, what you're, you're very familiar with in terms of our HP bond program. Uh, there is a money allotted that it doesn't specify who gets those grants in the future. It's to address a, a need, in that case it's HP bond funding, that then there's a, a program to go through, and that's how that money gets awarded. So it, it's entirely within the way scopes work for a bond to say, here's a program that we want funding for for a capital need for the city, and then the city has a third-party consultant advising us legally what's the best way to address this. And so while uh, the, the concerns that have been brought forward are very valid and need to be addressed. There are a lot of those, and that, from an ADA perspective, needs to be uh, evaluated and prioritized by an expert, not a, a, a committee's making decisions based upon who shows up or doesn't show up on projects, because ultimately they all need to be addressed, but there's only so much money that can be allocated to it, and so that's what the city's consultant will help us prioritize in a manner that is defensible and serves the public as, as best as we can with that limited funding. Is there allocated general funds from year to year dealing with ADA in the, gen the city's general budget? Yes, um, Madam Chair, Member Reiner. The, um, there's a few ways that ADA needs are satisfied throughout the course of uh, the operating budget, essentially. Uh, one, one manner is if there is an ongoing project. So for example, in City Hall right now, we are having to replace the sewer line throughout uh, City Hall. In the, in the process of doing that, as we're in the restrooms, if there are ADA needs that need to be addressed, we address those as part of the project. So that's one manner in which uh, upgrades are made when there's an ongoing project. 
Um, another, another manner is if there's a critical priority that's identified. Um, the city has a deferred maintenance program and can apply for that program, but those are prioritized based on um, life safety needs, things like that. So a lot of the investments over the last couple of years have been in fire life safety systems, which have been a deferred maintenance item. And, and if I may, just uh, to share, we shared this with the Neighborhoods and City Services Committee so I can share with you all. The reason this is structured as a program with $2 million a year of investment as ADA needs are identified through the assessments uh, is, is to ensure that we're demonstrating to the Department of Justice that we're making a commitment as a city to make and continue to make investments in ADA improvements. Uh, that is a best practice as recommended to us by those in the ADA professional community. I hope you're also doing that to demonstrate that to us as a community. Um, so thank you for that explanation. I got a question. Oh, go ahead. Is there a way to get an itemized list of all the ADA improvements that have been made in the last two years and also the cost of that and the locations? I might. I might see if you would be okay directing this a little bit differently. Um, I, I do want staff to walk us through the executive committee process for determining projects because I know we're thinking about this as our bucket of money. Um, you know, we can we can modify that amount of money, and if we you know feel that the Phoenix Theater project needs to be prioritized with X amount of money, um, that's something that we can make the case for when we put forward to the executive committee to help to raise awareness not only through our subcommittee but through the executive committee as a whole. Um, and I, I don't know if that list of what's been done the last two years will help us push forward it as a project from our subcommittee. Um, but maybe I'll defer to staff to see what your recommendations are related to that. So, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the subcommittee, I think what what I would say as it relates to the executive committee and the, the work of, of the subcommittee is, uh, as you noted earlier on, it's one $500 million, uh, you know, bond program. And so the, the subcommittees were put together as an idea of how to divide up some of that work so that on these important topic areas, people who are uh, you know, closest to those issues can come up with a prioritized list of what's most important uh, to help, in this case, for arts and culture. Um, and so what, what are those critical uh, you know, needs? And then prioritize those. And separately, that money question is going to come into play in some fashion. But ultimately, the executive committee will get a recommendation from the subcommittee. But that's not binding at all on what the executive committee recommends and does. So they can uh, look at your prioritized list. They can move priorities around in there. They can allocate different money associated with that. They will be looking at, well, what came out of uh, the city and uh, neighborhoods uh, bond program for this $10.1 million and looking at that relative to, okay, what was funded and decided here and trying to figure out how they get from $647 million down to that 500 million ultimately. And so what I would encourage you guys to, to look at this through is prioritizing the critical projects from the, the lens of what's most beneficial to, to the arts in Phoenix and, and look at it from that overall perspective as you think about how you want to rank those ones and then from there start looking at how to allocate some you know, money associated with recognizing that what you're doing is making that recommendation to the executive committee that ultimately after the fourth meeting will be recorded and put on a, a standardized form that all the subcommittees will, information will be put on and then budget and research will transmit that up to uh, you know, the full executive committee for discussion. I don't wanna speak for all of us yet, but I think through the process, uh, it'll become apparent that ADA Compliance and, and improvements is important to all of us, um, and so that Phoenix Theater project, I would imagine, will um, be within our, our list. Is there anything more, Sam? I didn't mean to redirect your question to staff, but I, I just wanted to insert um, what that what those next steps look like in terms of the executive committee. Um, would you still like to see that list brought forward at our next meeting? Yeah, I just want to understand more and how like the cost of the past ADA improvements 
look like and particularly in the arts and culture or, or just overall, just to kind of understand as I look at it like this. If I'm an investor of $500 million and um, I, I want to know like what has been done with that group to to how they utilize the money in the past, so and then I understand and how that can how and how that's going to be utilized in the future. So it's just more for me to understand um, those numbers and how that works and and that itemized list of in the last two to three years or whatever that can be uh, given. So, oh, Madam Chair, uh, Member Gomez, if I could, when uh, Joe and I were just talking about this, the the vast majority of it is not going to be broken out by an ADA project, uh, because as, as was, was mentioned, typically what is done is a larger project, and in going in and doing whatever that larger project is, they are retrofitting items to meet current ADA versus what it was before. And so there's a total project cost that was with that, but they don't believe they have ready access to in the time we would need to be able to pull out what was the ADA cost associated with that. I think what we can come back with is a list of what are some of those typical things that have been done over the last couple of years in that ADA area so you can get an example of what that is um, and we can pull out some of that information to share with, with the committee. And I also just want to share that as um, an organization that has tenants, you know, we had an, an organization tenant that had an issue with an ADA accessible door in the restroom and so we put in a work order to have that replaced, and all we did was say, fix the door. So there's no calculation that that was an ADA request with public works. It's just to fix the door. So we don't necessarily code if it's an ADA request. We just ask that the whatever it is get fixed. M Madam Chair, if it's okay, um, I do know leadership for Phoenix Theater is here. Would you mind just addressing um, your past bond and any capital um, fundraising that you've done in the past in specific to this or just in general, please? <clears throat> Madam Chair and subcommittee um, and City of Phoenix, um, employees. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Barnard. I'm the producer and artistic director of <clears throat> the Phoenix Theater Company. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, to address your um, issue, we have um, attempted fundraising. As far as front of house ADA requirements, we have pretty much fulfilled those through okay. uh, fundraising efforts, etc. cetera. Um, but when it comes to um, where this particular ADA issue has been, it, is, it has never been um, a, um, we have tried to fundraise around certain things like if you try to fundraise around uh, bathrooms or, or ramps or, or things like that, um, it is not as exciting or enticing to fundraisers as it is um, for programming or rehearsal halls or the things of that nature. <clears throat> so it is. So we have been trying to make do all these years, um, and that. But um, we live in a new world now, and um, things are becoming more uh, fervent um, in our need to um, fix and fix it permanently. Um, to be clear, uh, we, we did go to neighborhood services about ADA, and um, <clears throat> through their discussions, it was very clear to us that they felt that this was the subcommittee that we should come back to. So um, uh, at this stage, uh, the lack of ADA um, accessibility to our offices and backstage um, uses, um, <clears throat> in particular rehearsal halls and, and uh, things like that, it can't wait um, another uh, five to ten years um, because as it stands now, if you, if you voted it in, it's going to take us a couple of years to even get this, you know, um, put together. Um, as it is, um, there's an expectation that the city, uh, city facilities will be accessible to all. And, of course, that's why we're here. Uh, the bond seems to be our only chance at correcting this for the next decade. 
um, and we, uh, we're deeply worried about an ADA claim um, against us um, in, the, in the years going uh, to happen if we don't <coughs> fix this as soon as humanly possible. Um, we are going to fundraise, however, around this um, for interior um, um, funding, for the interiors of um, a, a new rehearsal hall, a new back, backstage um, access space, um, et cetera. To, um, so we are going to be a part of this request. We would like to be a part of this request. We humbly ask you to help us help the city, help our managing director and other staff members who um, struggle to get to our offices and bathrooms, help our artists um, who um, have uh, mobility challenges of all ages, and our youth participants that also have mobility challenges uh, to be able to fully participate in the jobs, our programs, and our services. Um, our request is about basic needs to be able to provide what we are trying to provide for, for our community in the arts. Uh, I did want to point out <coughs> that uh, public works did come to us, and at, for, a, for a while they thought there might be a, 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 an ability to retrofit, retrofit um, an elevator, uh, <coughs> elevator accessibilities, but, um, but then they determined that it was not a feasible uh, thing at all. You'd have to see our building it, that was built in 1951. Um, it's built on <laughs> these slightly different levels, and there's no way to, like, you can get to one, you can get to one area that might lead you into the rehearsal halls, but then you have to go up three or four more steps to get to a bathroom. Then you have to go up two more, th three more steps to get to um, <clears throat> other access points of the backstage. So they basically said, what you really need to do is create a new building. This information didn't come out or come to us until the day after we were able to submit. And that's why um, we have been coming to you in the last couple of Can I ask you the $5.8 million you're asking for? We mm -hmm. have not, we've just given a, a number. Can we have a better understanding of what that entails? Um, it is possible to retrofit the building with five eight five point eight million dollars. No, it's not. It, it wouldn't be a retrofit. It would be a new building. So, it so would be you're a asking building for a new building on the property. Yeah, you're, a whole new building for your. See, we don't have this information. I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't know if you guys do, but I want to understand what your five point eight million dollar budget is for. Could you provide a budget to us and how sure. you came up with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, it was presented to you yeah. not with the um, baseline information, but in the last presentation, it would be an addition that would be put onto the current building yeah. to um, help these areas. Um, and we also showcased where that would be on the property at the last meeting. But we can get that information to you along with what the scope that was submitted by the Phoenix Theater and our city engineer's office. In the interest of time, it's eight minutes until 11. Uh, if I'm allowed, I'd like to change the order of this agenda item number three and ask staff to share your presentation on the survey tool that uh, you will make available to us if we so choose to use it. From there, determine our uh, list of projects and then take public comment uh, to ensure the subcommittee has the time left uh, to conduct the business we need to conduct. Madam Chairman? Yes. I, I would like to make a comment on the, on the Phoenix Theater before we uh, leave that subject. The, the back of the house, uh, sir, um, people in wheelchairs go to the back of the house as well. And I mention that because my son goes to the back of the house. He's in a wheelchair. It, 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 we're talking about, ultimately, we're talking about money, but uh, understanding this process, it's been clearly explained. Uh, it will go to the executive committee, and they will make judgments as to how much money and what the priority shall be. And then, ultimately, it will go to the city council. And they will ultimately make a judgment, uh, part of that judgment, whether it will uh, uh, maintain the $500 million cap or whether they can adjust it upwards. The $500 million cap is based upon interpretation of two separate state laws 
and it is the safest place to land. It is not the only place to land, and so the council is going to have to consider whether they go to 600 million or 580 million based upon what they perceive to be their priorities. So what we're doing here is in part prioritizing projects that we think are uh, extraordinarily important uh, in the arts. And I understand that. But let me go specifically uh, to, to, to Phoenix Theater. I, I fully endorse and I believe we should endorse that project. Uh, but in, 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 in uh, legislative proposals, both in Congress and state legislatures, there is a process known as the footnote. Uh, you cannot legislate in the budgetary process. But what you can do is give instructions, uh, give instructions as to how you perceive its use. And, and I, I would like at the appropriate time for us to in fact endorse the, the, the uh, Phoenix Theater project and finally deal with this. But I'd, I'd like to add a, a footnote to that. And that is, here's what's going to happen. We endorse it. It goes <laughs> to the next committee. They presumably endorse it. It goes to the city council. Let's assume they endorse it. It goes to bond lawyers, and it's drafted and redrafted. It goes to bond houses in New York. Uh, they uh, they uh, put an imprimatur on it, and it goes to the voters. And on we go. So r finally dealing with a, a, a issue of blatant discrimination, outright blatant discrimination, is going to take five years, four years, because when it all comes back, it then has to go to bidding. You can't just select a contract. Five years to deal with an issue of blatant discrimination. So what I'd like to do when this comes up is to add that footnote that says that it sits and, 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 and I'll, write it, I'll write it if it's my responsibility in a moderate fashion, please be assured, uh, but it should be written in outrageous fashion that this hasn't been dealt with year after year after year and there are responsible parties, the, the, the city council, mayors, and the directors of the theater they can't get out of uh, responsibility for this as well. This is blatant discrimination. I think that endorsement should also include that it should go, uh, that this should be part of the general fund at the next budget. We should not wait six years to deal with blatant discrimination. It should be brought to the attention of the council, to the new city manager, that this is going on and that it should be immediately taken care of, and it should be in the budget. Uh, and so we should give them that option and that direction. I get emotional, thank oh, you. No, thank you, and, and I will, along with staff support, have an opportunity to present our recommendations to the executive committee, and at the next meeting when we get to that point of uh, prioritizing, identifying amounts, I believe we should also discuss the footnote that you just um, suggested and offered to draft for us that could accompany or be a part of that presentation. So we will keep that in the minutes and make sure it's a discussion point uh, for our presentation that I'll eventually, along with staff, make to the executive committee. The footnote will only be modestly outraged. Only modestly outrageous. We will note that as well. Uh, Thank you. It, Madam Chair, uh, Member Gutierrez, if I could just clarify my comments in no way were meant to disparage that important need for a back-of-house ADA improvement. It was simply trying to illustrate that there isn't enough money to do all of that at once, and so the consultant will be helping us, along with the law department, prioritize where to make those ADA improvements that are going to serve the majority of people, and that's probably the, the things that the public is interacting from that has the front of house type of operations only by way of, of explanation. Not meant to say that that's not absolutely important to do those things in the back as well. And I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and then we do have uh, Mitch to go over quickly 
where things were uh, in terms of the prioritized needs, and uh, then we have Adam from our budget and research department to talk about the potential of how uh, you guys might want to go forward and start a, a ranking process and, and looking at setting things up for a good discussion at your next meeting. And before you begin, to the members of the committee, does anyone have a hard stop? A hard stop? Um, do you have 10, 15 minutes for us to go over? I just don't want to lose members of the committee before we receive this important information. Okay. Uh, All right. So be I'll quick, do so don't hurry. Quickly. So the prioritized capital needs here are the Children's Museum of Phoenix, the Latino Cultural Center, the Office of Arts and Culture's Facility Critical Maintenance, Value Theater's Permanent Home, Symphony Hall Theatrical Venue Improvements, the future capital needs included the Arizona Jewish Historical Society expansion, the Herberger Theater's theatrical improvements. The proposed capital projects by the community was an updated scope of the Children's Museum of Phoenix expansion, the Herberger Theater Center Pavilion stage, the Phoenix Center for the Arts Repairs and Repainting project, and the Phoenix Theater Company ADA project. All of this totals, and if we take into consideration the updated scope of the Children's Museum of Phoenix, comes to $85.6 million. I'll turn it over to Adam. Thank you, Director Menchaca, Deputy City Manager Stevenson, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Uh, this subcommittee has uh, asked a lot of great questions, received a lot of information about arts and culture projects, but ultimately the subcommittee is tasked with developing a rank ordered list that in your opinion cannot be deferred to a future bond program. The approved ranking will be forwarded as a recommendation to the executive committee. I want to emphasize that the subcommittee's recommendation is not the final opportunity for the public to weigh in. The executive committee will continue to receive public input as will city council as it considers the over, overall bond program recommendation later this year. The subcommittee has this meeting and your final meeting on September 30th to complete your task. The basic questions are, first, how will you go about identifying the list of projects that will be considered? And second, how will you go about ranking those projects by priority? Additionally, the subcommittee has been asked to recommend funding levels for each project. Ultimately, your method of developing a recommendation for executive committee is at the full discretion of the subcommittee. However, if desired, the subcommittee, if desired by the subcommittee, staff is prepared to support the process by distributing a survey tool for members to complete independent rankings. The survey will include the complete list of projects identified by the subcommittee, allow for members to rank those projects, and allow for members to identify if a particular project should be funded at a higher or lower level or identify if a project may be deferred and should not receive funding. The survey is a web-based application that would be distributed and completed following this meeting. Staff will provide a presentation summarizing the combined results at the following meeting, and members will have the opportunity to discuss your choices and your rationale, but individual rankings will not be included in staff's presentation. The survey results are not binding. The intent is not that the outcome of the survey would dictate this subcommittee's recommendation but rather act as a starting point for the subcommittee to begin deliberating on the ranking. Again, the decision to use the survey tool is entirely at the discretion and direction of the subcommittee. If this is something the subcommittee would like to consider, then you'll need to collectively firm up the list of projects today so the survey can be prepared and results can be presented at your final meeting. Again, that's scheduled for September 30th. With that, I can take any questions on the survey tool. Is there a place for comments? You know, um, what your, why you evaluated something this way? I mean, I, I don't like the yes, no, and all that kind of stuff. I, I really believe in having some text. Or do I save all of those comments for when we have our discussion if we use this tool? Yes, I think our place is at the next meeting to share your comments um, based on how you answer the survey. I dislike surveys like that. <laughs> oh, sure. It's just a tool for us to have a chance to gather our thoughts, uh, spend some time thinking through the projects, what we want to 
recommend we move forward with, and then again, we'll rank order together at the next meeting. Madam Chair, I, I think a tool like this would be very useful for me. Personally, it, it, um, there's a lot to keep track of, and giving us the ability to, to do that in sort of an organized fashion certainly can't hurt. So the purpose of the tool is uh, it's a discussion tool? Yes. It, 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 I'm, 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 uh, I'm just uncomfortable with it, but let's, let's, uh, let's do it, I guess. Solely a discussion tool, a way for those of us who find it useful um, to, to utilize it, to collect our thoughts, spend time rank, or not ranking at this point, but spend time putting together the projects that we think should be recommended to the executive committee. And again, as a group, we'll um, finalize that list and then rank order them. We have a lot of work to do at our next meeting. Madam Chair, I would just like to jump in as well, um, understanding the tool. It also allows us to put our voice forward um, individually and then collectively see what kind of comes to the top for us. So it allows everyone to do that versus bringing up the project in front of everyone. You get to actually put your needs down um, on there, and then we have a discussion. So this would be done prior to the next meeting? Absolutely. Well, I have some questions that would even may preclude my even rating or ranking a couple of the options um, that had to be answered before I could even use a tool. Are they questions that could be answered through email before we Well, I think you'd survey? all want to know the answers to them. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the big questions for me is whether or not city funding can be spent at the Arizona Jewish Historical Society because it's a non-city property. This is something I had asked Adam about, but I guess it's being reviewed by the legal department. I mean, is it, can we even give money to a non-city entity for the building? We have an answer to that question now. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, Patty Bowen with the law department. Um, we have to receive consideration. The city has to receive consideration that's tantamount to the amount of money we're giving. So most of these projects are on city-owned property, so um, the benefit to the city is clear. There has to be a benefit given to the city by the Jewish um, Cultural Society for us to be able to give them money. So I don't know what form that takes if you give them a million dollars you know, we have to be given a, a portion of a building that's worth a million dollars, um, for instance. So it's not a more ethereal kind of, I mean, it's a very important project. I don't want to indicate that it's not in terms of what they're doing, but you're saying as long, yes, we can include them in the ranking if they agree to give the city an equivalent amount of ownership and physical, it's got to be physical. It's got to be okay. So you are well. Saying, it has to. Be, it has to be material. It has to be tangible. Tangible. It, That's what I tangible. mean by physical. Yeah. So right. it's it is a legitimate expenditure, and there is precedent for having spent money at a non-city owned facility. And it, it's it's hard to say that there's precedent because. The um, law on the gift clause on the Constitution has changed considerably since 2006, the last time we had a bond program. So, um, as I said, the courts have expanded on, on the meaning of the gift clause and made it clear that the government entity has to receive equivalent consideration. Okay, but it's legitimate for us to be considering this and recommending it as a project because in the future, whatever needs to be done will be done to make sure that the city gets what it needs in, in, uh, in physical. Correct. Or yeah, Correct. okay. And I had some questions about the Latino Cultural Center too because they're asking uh, for $21.7 Again, I think this is a very important project especially given that almost 50% of our population is Latino, and that this is not a comment on that, but I don't think that given the state of the, I couldn't even find an organization online that is really spearheading this. So, and given the fact that the plan is to include staff 
within the arts and culture department to grow it and incubate it to become, make it possible for the Latino Cultural Center to move forward. And the fact that they, if we give them 21.7 million or whatever it is, there is, they have five years to do this. They have five years to make this building. So I, I think the timing is really off with the Latino Cultural Center, unfortunately. And I don't, I think there's a lack of organizational and leadership capacity to pull it off. Um, I just think it's premature. And I, rather than vote on 21.7, which is almost half of what we have to vote for, um, to be included in this bond program, I, my, my, my sense is that it's not, the timing is wrong. They don't have the capacity um, or the organizational ability to do this in five years. And Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, the organization that spearheads that is the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture. That is what the, the Latino Cultural Center Ad Hoc Committee recommended to City Council. So it is my department that put that $21 million forward. The other um, recommendations from that report that were submitted to um, the subcommittee is that we would pull together a, a friends of or a advisory board that would work with the department to build that. We also have a position that was funded in this last um, budget cycle that would spearhead this development along with our other facilities. So the department has the organizational capacity and has been tiered up for this project. Thank you. And, and uh, I would just add that the, that the community organizations uh, necessary to proceed forward and frankly to raise substantial dollars beyond the 21 million is also um, uh, in place, uh, coming together, it's being led by CPLC, and so it's, it, it, it is moving at a, at, a, at, a, at a great pace. There have been meetings with city council people, et cetera. So, so I think it's realistic to, to, to go forward at this point. Ultimately, of course, all of this will be sitting before the city council. And, uh, and that plan uh, uh, that uh, Mr. Menchaca mentions, which is the plan in this, or whether it is expanded beyond that, will go before the council. But, but the dollar figures are not based on what I understand is, is accurate. I mean, I don't know, uh, Alfredo, you said that you don't feel that it needs to be at the North Building, it needs to be somewhere else. And I think the budget is based upon the North Building is that is that, that, that that's correct i mean i i believe the budget is, is based upon the notion that in the 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 fifth largest city in the united states with almost half the population being latino it should go to a uh, 20,000 square foot church that has no relationship to the latino community that's in care in fact what they put together what we are saying is okay that may be what we ultimately have to settle for. Who's we? The, the, the larger Hispanic community, and I've mentioned some of the organizations, et cetera, that are coming about. Uh, uh, but I think that, that, uh, uh, that it is, the goal is to make it greater rather than lesser. And so that the amount of money we're talking about will absolutely be necessary, but again, uh, we will have to be before the city council and make uh, uh, a case that the 21 million is a starting amount for this project to ultimately be built. This is a dream that's been going on for years. It is unfortunate uh, that, uh, that uh, it was minimized in this fashion. It is, uh, it's, 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 that's unfortunate. But, but we've the opportunity to make it uh, to make it real and madam, madam chair. chair members of the subcommittee the direction which we've heard from some of our community members like the phoenix theater that there was a, a deadline for hard factual information what the department had to go on was the recommendation of that facility to get those hard numbers on something because without them this would not be presented to you. So again, the $21 million would go to the project. And so much like some of these ground up projects, as uh, member Gutierrez says, could be used if the North Building is not used for brand new construction on a space 
determined by um, city council, the new friends group, etc. Madam Chair. Let, let me add that this proposal would be approved at 21 million, and if in fact an alternative is not adopted, then this would be what goes forward. So it isn't, uh, 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 it, it isn't something that I think we should dispense with. I think we should go forward with it, uh, but the committee should know uh, that there are discussions uh, uh, to, to, to make this greater than uh, the 21 million, most of that through other sources. Um, Ms. Bolin, I mean, I, I'm very familiar with the conservation easement, so is that, would that fit into this whole gift clause conundrum if money was given to the Jewish Cultural Center? Um, Dr. Reiner, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, I mean, previously when HP has given out uh, funds to private homes and buildings and stuff, there's been a conservation easement right. based on, you know, the length has been based on the amount of funds. Is, um, so I was wondering, is that something that could happen with in this situation? Uh, with um, conservation easements, um, we get the conservation easement in exchange for the funding, mm -hmm. the grant that we give, but that is a tangible asset to the city because of the historical nature of the property. Ah. And, and to release a conservation easement, actually, we have one going um, to council next week, a, a payment has to be made to get the release of the conservation easement. But it's the conservation easement that is the consideration for the grant funds. And so that would be theoretically possible if um, we move the bond forward on the Jewish Cultural Center? It, not, not a conservation easement because okay. those are, it's very clear in the code that those are given for historical purposes. Well, but this is a historic building. It is listed both on the city and the national. It, it's conceivable, but then it wouldn't be these bond funds okay. necessarily. Okay. It would be historic preservation funds. Okay, all right. Thank you. So, uh, Madam Chair, Dr. Uh, Reiner, if I could add, I think the, the unique thing about this, if that was the route, is the, the, the million dollars is considerably more than other historic preservation grants. They're typically much smaller amounts, and the, the time frame goes up with the amounts. And so, I think what we we can say uh, is that we have had discussions with the Jewish Historical Society and they recognize that if they are funded out of this they will sit down with the city and figure out what is a, a tangible item that the city can have as part of of satisfying the gift clause issue um, but rather than going through that with them now we are waiting to see where they end up in this process and they are, are good with that approach thank you any other questions? I make sure we have a chance to ask all of them. Just as a reminder to the committee, we did get the, the ad hoc committee recommendations and the, the reports for the Latino Cultural Center sent to us after the first meeting, uh, which there's a ton of great information in there about the process. Um, I was just looking at it now. And uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, I will make sure that you get the um, full scope on the Phoenix Theater, the Phoenix Center for the Arts and the Valley Youth Theater projects as requested. Um, if that does help in your um, deliberation if you go forward with the survey tool. Thank you for that recap. In addition, uh, the, the request that came from, from Member Gomez, the estimated cost of ADA improvements um, as, as he asked for the last two or three years, but um, and what Alan recommended would be, would suffice. Those, those improvement estimates to give us a sense of, of what this work typically costs. Yep, we'll develop a, a list of what was funded 
be a larger projects. It, the numbers won't be that relevant because it's those are larger projects, but we'll tell you what's been done in that space over the last couple of years. And then also at our next meeting, Phoenix Center for the Arts and staff will come back with what the Phoenix Center for the Arts revised uh, scope of work and, and request is for the subcommittee. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I think one of the, the discussions that we did have uh, that was had with Cynthia Aguilar uh, to try and get at this, this issue of what's maintenance and, and what is other items that, uh, you know, that a PCA wants to, uh, to have. And what we talked about was working on a list where there are potential bond funds that would be a request for future improvements under maintenance obligations that would be spelled out in the contract, those specific items uh, would be an ask of the parks subcommittee and then other ones to have that are, for lack of a better way to describe them, the, the you know, nice to have things that are helping them do some of the arts programming and, and having better theater seats and those, those things that portion of their request would be what we would uh, have come here for you guys to consider. Uh, if that helps you, and then we'll figure out what that is, but that's how we will try and break that out to, to get to the question that you raised of, well, what's, what's maintenance that would have fit in Mitch's recommendation that he brought forward, for example, um, and those are ones that we'll, we'll cover in discussions with the, the park subcommittee, and then the above and beyond we come here. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, just to clarify and restate, it sounds like what you're saying is stuff like floors is going to the other bond subcommittee and stuff like seats is coming to us. Is that what, is that what I'm hearing you say? Well, uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, I think what, uh, what will have to be discussed and talked about is it, it, what are the floors? So if, if there's a, a floor that is only because I'm a, a dance floor, that's more art than I think that would be coming here. If it's, fixing the floors and having a, you know, a decent floor that would be passable for any city building, then that would be a, a maintenance you know, replacement. I'll, I'll jump for. in with my direction to staff from earlier in the meeting. Uh, we will let the two partners discuss between now and September 30th uh, what is critical, can be covered by other budget, by the City of Phoenix Parks and Rec Department, what is critical that cannot be that Phoenix Center for the Arts would like to bring forward to us to consider as part of our subcommittee recommendations. And I hope that as partners, um, they're able to mutually agree upon what is uh, brought forward to us as a subcommittee. Madam Chair, I, I hate to be pedantic on this, but if, if that is the direction that we're giving to staff, I want to make sure that the, the maintenance obligations that the city is responsible for don't get lost by getting sent to the other subcommittee. Uh, I, 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 maybe I'm misunderstanding what's being said, but uh, like the parks and recreation obligations, if they're sent to a parks and recreation subcommittee and then don't get funded? I believe they're being essentially sent to the budget, um, other, other funding sources that are not bond related. Um, so, our, so what staff will come back with are those critical needs that will be paid for through other funding, other funding being Department's operating budget, et cetera. And they, the Parks Department has, uh, as, as Ms. Aguilar alluded to, uh, what's 3PI funding. They have other funding sources. I think what, what staff has uh, discussed and what we will have committed to is taking the portion of the longer-term maintenance that would be a bond item discussion to the Parks Bonds Committee so it's not something that you have to look at funding. Um, but there are other opportunities to fund that that might not be in the bond. So even if it's not ranked there, what the Parks Department has committed to is using their other funding to make sure that those, uh, you know, that maintenance is done. And that's something we'll have to work out with the theater and or with the, the organization as in terms of timing and how they coordinate all of that stuff. But there's other funding buckets to make that happen. Okay, thank you. We look forward to hearing what the resolution of the discussion is. Any other questions or comments? Okay. 
are we generally supportive of using the survey tool? And I'm happy to uh, go to vote if there is um, concern over using it as a discussion tool. I, I think it's just, I want to see it, I'll give it a try. If I don't like it, I don't have to push submit. Madam Chair, just a question on the Children's Museum of Phoenix expansion project. Since we were presented five different um, options, do we need to have a discussion about that before it goes to the survey tool? How does that work? So, uh, Madam Chair, um, members of the committee, that, that's a great question. Before we get to that one, I, I do want to uh, clarify with Ms. Reiner that we would ask that everyone vote uh, on it because it doesn't it doesn't do us any good if you some members don't do it as a place to start it's only a place to start a discussion and uh, Adam can show you a, a couple slides uh, if, you know if you wish to kind of see what it, it looks like and what it comes down to is it helps rank some orders so that maybe there's really good consensus on a top and bottom that everyone agrees on and you cannot spend time talking about that and focus on where there's that disagreement uh, given your short time frame that you have to do that. And so that's really what the, the tool will end up helping because you have to take a vote in public to rank them. The, the tool is not going to do any of that. It's just going to help you eliminate hopefully a, a top and bottom where there's consensus that makes it or doesn't and then you can focus in your discussion on. Madam Chair, could we see the slides that show the survey tool? Absolutely. Madam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. I have a, a series of slides that are just screenshots from the, from the survey tool that you'll actually receive. Uh, so the survey link will be distributed to the subcommittee members. Uh, it should not be shared. Only the subcommittee member responses will be tabulated. As you can see, we're asking for your name and email address so we can tr keep track of uh, uh, who is uh, responding to the survey. Um, as you know, you are tasked with uh, providing a rank ordered list. We will provide the list of projects in alphabetical order. Uh, your task is to reorder those projects based on your priority. Uh, ironically, what you're looking at is a sample from the parks uh, subcommittee. Um, of course, this will feature your projects when you receive the survey link. Uh, the survey tool is pretty simple. It's a, a select the icon, click it and drag it, and the ranking number will automatically populate. Uh, as I mentioned previously, you will also have the opportunity to identify whether a particular project should receive more funding. You would simply click the box if you think it should receive more uh, increased funding under question four. Uh, under question five, uh, if a project should receive decreased funding, just click the box. And finally, if there are any projects in the list that you don't believe should go forward, should not be funded through this bond program, you'll have the opportunity to identify those as well. Staff will, again, provide the summary results. Uh, you'll have the opportunity during your discussion to, to, to explain your rationale. Madam Does that, Chair. Oh. Will that include all the projects? I mean, the, so, the proposed and the... the I believe the we wishful. still need to decide that today before we before we adjourn. And we can go back to the, that summary slide if that's helpful. When we get Madam to that Chair, point. I just had a quick question. Uh, Adam, how long do we have to complete the survey? So you'll have approximately three days. We'll okay. try to get the survey out early next week, uh, target getting responses back by the end of next week so that we can compile information, get it ready for your agenda packets for the 30th. Madam Chair, if I could, uh, as we're discussing the, the items that we'd like to get in the survey, if I could kick that off with the Children's Museum because we've got a lot of different options that were presented by staff to us. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, my, my suggestion was just simply that um, that we we have multiple options for the Children's Museum presented to us within the survey tool, uh, one with the full scope and perhaps one with the 1.8 scope that is the revised dollar figure for the four room option. 
Give chances, uh, I'll give staff a chance to respond to that because we don't want to necessarily dilute the ranking of the Children's Museum project. So you're recommending? Yeah, I think, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, what a staff would recommend is that the subcommittee decide on what's your universe of projects. You have them listed here from your prioritized, what was proposed, and the future ones, and come up with that list. And as it because uh, that's what we'll survey on. Um, and then as it relates to the Children's Museum, if you don't pick one of those ones to, to go forward, you have the chance of diluting the success of it because people may be split on how much funding should go to the Children's Museum and so therefore it won't rank as high. Where if it's just one, you're not, again, not bound by whatever comes out of that survey to say it has to stay in that order and with that money, you could then look at making monetary adjustments. But because the survey tool is just ranking things based upon numbers, you could split up how many people want to see that, uh, in, that move forward because of the different values. Does that make sense? We also don't have the benefit of the other projects that are going to be coming in at a lower amount like the, I mean, the Phoenix uh, Center for the Arts. We, we can't compare those two. So I think it's better just to look at the, the organization and, and what they're proposing. That makes sense. Madam Chair, I'm going to agree with that. Um, I'm not comfortable recommending uh, one about at this time, but um, putting each organization on there that we have chosen for the survey. And we do have one organization with two projects, um, so we would just need to, to denote that. Staff, is that possible? Sorry, he calling you staff. Alan, is that possible? Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, I, I, I think we would need to make sure that everybody on the subcommittee understands what it is that you're ranking. Um, we have flexibility in how the survey is structured but if one, one member thinks that they're ranking a project A and the other member assumes that's project B, it might be difficult to reconcile that during your fourth meeting. I think uh, our recommendation would be to nail some of those things down as best as possible today uh, before we put the survey together. But, but we can, we have flexibility in how we phrase those project names. And certainly. just to be clear, none of the other projects will have these amounts assigned to them. We aren't ranking the project in the amount at this time because that will be part of our discussion at our fourth meeting. It's, it's just because there are three options proposed for the Children's Museum of Phoenix that we need to, to your point, try to narrow it down to one. Madam Chair, if I could, um, if, if it's staff's recommendation that we just say Children's Museum, what I'd like to do is put a footnote to that in the survey tool that whatever comes up with the Children's Museum, whatever the survey result is, that we have a discussion on it regardless. So even if there's a unanimous response that, yes, we think that the Children's Museum is in that top bucket, we need to make sure that we talk about it. Um, you know, I know that this is a jumping off point, but um, certainly I don't want to gloss over that. Um, the other thing with the Herberger uh, Theater, um, if, if it's my understanding, staff is suggesting that we basically make a determination on which Herberger item we'd like to include, or, or can we say pavilion and interior in the actual wording of the survey? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, as long as you are clear in what it is you want to recommend that, that goes into the survey, tell us both of those we will combine both, that will be the base survey so that everyone knows. That's all we want to do. And then, then you can come back and then as you're talking about money, decide does that still include both? You know, whatever you'd like to do at that point from the, the money side of things. Madam Chair, my discomfort goes to precisely the money. We're, um, uh, it, it, it's not with prioritizing projects, but that, that it goes to specifically the money. I, you know, I've sat in appropriations committees before for state budgets and, uh, and uh, well, an, an entire array of things. And we usually understand <laughs> what we're looking at. 
There are line items that tell us the construction, the administration, etc., and that we can make a determination about the, uh, the, the financing that we're being requested. In this case, we have these amorphous general amounts, and as we just saw with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the, the theater, uh, there was no agreement on that either. I mean, they sort of moved around a bit, and uh, then we discussed whether or not it was maintenance or not maintenance. And I'm just uncomfortable that we have enough information to be an appropriations committee. Because what you're asking for now, selecting the amount, is for us to act as an appropriations committee. Uh, and I, I'm just uncomfortable that we do not have the information for that. I am very comfortable that we have heard enough about the projects to say we believe this is a significant project for the city of Phoenix and we should go forward. I am uncomfortable with saying, but therefore you should only get $3.2 million rather than $4.6 million because I just don't have the information to justify either number to my satisfaction. So that's my discomfort, is your insistence that we act as an appropriations committee without giving us the necessary information to do so, nor the time, frankly. It takes time uh, to act as an appropriations committee, and we haven't had the time nor the information. If receiving the detailed $5.8 million estimate for Phoenix Theater, the detailed $14 million estimate for Valley Youth Theater, by our next meeting when we are expected to discuss amounts, will that get us to a closer, uh, will that get us closer to being comfortable discussing or are there additional asks of staff between now and our fourth meeting? Do we have a choice? We have one more meeting to have this discussion. I, I'm asking are there additional requests of staff to get us to that, that place of comfort? My answer is I'm, I'm voting for the 5.8 million. How, however, <laughs> Do I know what that encompasses? How many, uh, how many bricks that means? I don't. Uh, and I think none of us do. And so we'll ultimately uh, are going to go with the numbers that, that are before us. That's my discomfort. It's, it's, it's not choosing projects. It's trying to act as an appropriations committee and saying, no, your estimation of 4.2 is wrong and we should have 5.6. Uh, we kind of, this is my, my earlier point, that we ultimately are being asked to choose sides here on the basis, I guess, who made the best presentation or uh, 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 who was uh, more articulate or, <laughs> or whatever reasons we choose to, but it isn't the facts uh, on the money. And so I, I'm just uncomfortable with choosing, with, with the recommendation uh, that we begin to rank money and or, and or change the amounts that have been recommended without the knowledge necessary to feel comfortable that we, that we can do that. So, uh, Madam Chair, uh, committee members, I'm going to ask Mitch to, to clarify, because we think we've given everything uh, that we have that's been provided relative to the proposals that the, the groups have, have put together, um, including the Children's Museum, we have their $5.3 you know, million uh, scope of work. Now, that's not a complete construction document about exactly which bricks, but it's a document that is used to budget and that has uh, the correct information in there. And then you'll recall that as part of the initial information that was provided, there was a sheet in there that talked about some of the, the the way staff came up with some of their costs and that laid out some of that stuff as well. And so, uh, you know, we think we've given you the vast majority of that stuff. Mitch, is there anything else that, other than what you have asked for, we will get that to you so that you guys can think about that as, you know, in between now and your, your next meeting. But I want to make sure that if there's something that we're missing that you think you need, let, let us know and we'll try and do what we can because we know that you've got a tough, uh, you know, choice that you've got to make in four meetings uh, and you know that timeline was was laid out for us and so we want to try and help you 
do what we can to get where you need to go. And we know it's a tough choice. So, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, everything in the prioritized and future capital needs have been vetted with backup documentation. For instance, the um, North Building that nobody wants to talk about has a 400-page assessment uh, from Gensler on that property. Um, Symphony Hall and the Convention Center have the background information on all that. That's how we put the prioritized and future capital needs. The proposed capital needs, Children's Museum, Herberger Theater Center, Phoenix Center for the Arts, and the Phoenix Theater, all provided you with those documents at our last meeting. So the organization themselves handed you those informations that came up with costs and sharing. And we have those documents, and again, I can share um, all of those um, proposed capital projects. I can also share the prioritize and future capital needs. I don't know what over a 1,000 pages will do for you in the next two weeks, except to say that prioritized and future capital needs were vetted for the information provided and the proposed capital projects, we required that they turn in um, information. The Children's Museum turned in a lot of information from Ryan Company, and I would say, and as I said earlier, that $5.3 million of an updated scope, if I had that in January in the shotgun time we had to put this together, that's probably what we would have presented. So we have all of this information, vetted documents, happy to share them with you, but even I, looking at them, have no idea what I'm reading. That's why I take the, the interest of folks like Alan and the city engineer's office to explain them to me. Okay, in the interest of time, I'd, I'd like to recommend, make a recommendation. I, I would like to respond to that, though. Well, it, it is make a response to that. But I would like to, okay. to insist that I may respond. Okay, in a, in a way it is a response, too. Um, so it is 11.40. We have a hard stop of, the meeting has a hard stop of noon. We do have 16 speakers registered to whom I'd each like to give at least one minute. So we must move to public comment within the next three minutes. And my recommendations, if, if supported by the committee, uh, my direction to staff is resend. So we have it all in one, one email, uh, those detailed cost estimates. Uh, all, all the information that you have, everyone comes to their conclusions differently. Um, so if, if someone would like to read the 400 pages, let's do it. Resend it all um, in one email in time for our next meeting. In terms of the survey, let's include all projects listed on the current slide. Children's Museum, no amount uh, determined or recommended at this point. We will have to figure it out together at our next meeting, and we will just list it as Children's Museum. And I'll look to the members of the committee, uh, Donna, and then. Okay. My understanding is initially that we actually have the opportunity, if necessary, for another meeting after September 30th. And I feel as if we have got a lot of things. Um, I'm not comfortable necessarily being King Solomon or Queen Solomon, whatever, in making these decisions. So I, th I think we should seriously consider taking that October meeting so that we can not feel we're rushed in the September 30th meeting. Um, Absolutely. And I would just ask that we spend time with the documents that will be provided to us between now and the September 30th meeting uh, in an attempt to, you know, see if we have enough time at that meeting to come to our recommendations. Um, and then if not, staff, I'll ask, is that accurate? We could ask, a, an we could ask to add an additional meeting if needed. M Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, there simply isn't time in the calendar to add another meeting. The executive committee uh, will be starting their meetings uh, right on the tails of subcommittees wrapping up. I have a problem with this being rushed, and there's a public perception of everything being rushed, and so perhaps the executive committee could make that exception and should consider making those exceptions. Madam Chair Member uh, Reiner, Dr. Reiner, that's certainly something that the executive committee may decide, but we as staff can't guarantee you that here. And so I, I, we would advise you to do everything you can to get your work done at this next meeting. Uh, it's only advice we, I give you because we don't control whether or not that happens. So that would be our advice to you guys. Well, perhaps our chair can make that urgent request and I can contact my contacts on there. <laughs> uh, no, under, understood. Thank you for that additional direction. 
Again, I'll ask that we come as prepared as possible to our fourth meeting, and if we feel we need more time to discuss and determine our recommendations, uh, then yes, I would be willing to uh, submit that request to the executive committee, whatever that, that process looks like. Uh, I don't think other committees have um, as many projects that, are, that have such great needs as, as we have uh, to consider here, and uh, do appreciate the need to have as much time to determine our recommendations. You know, we haven't even discussed um, proposed criteria for making these determinations, how we as a group are going to, what criteria we are going to be using to um, make these recommendations. I mean, it seems it's a little premature to be ranking them when we haven't even discussed the criteria for, for doing that ranking. And I, I've, I put something together on my own, um, but I don't know how others feel about making the rankings without any really committee criteria for doing so. So it's a good question and I think a good reminder for us that those that that criteria was really outlined in the critical needs study as part of the uh, the memo uh, prepared by the city manager so perhaps at our next meeting that could be one of our opening slides to review those I believe it's five or six uh, criteria that are outlined as as what we should utilize to prioritize. Are you speaking about the city departments and managers office criteria for capital bond project selection? Is that what you're referring to? Because I went through all the documents and I'm not sure what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm just trying to find the, the memo that I am referencing. It was um, included along with a critical needs study. And I, I don't recall the date that it was sent out. I don't know if staff has it readily available. I can sift through my packet. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, the, the memo that the, that, that the chairwoman is referring to is dated June 27th, uh, sent to all members of the bond committee um, from the city manager. And we could certainly include that along with, again, the resending of all the, the project information. Um, and again, just create a slide with those uh, requirements listed so we have that as our, our guiding tool. Thank you. So that's our criteria. Okay, I would like to receive that because I've, I've looked through the documents. I think I know what you're talking about, but I'm not certain, so I need to understand what the criteria for my ranking is going to be. And it has to be that, where there are no other considerations in terms of ranking, it has to be what, what they're asking for. Is that correct? That's our criteria, that's our ranking criteria? That's the recommendation from the city manager, yes. I would really like to understand what those are because I don't I don't currently we will make sure that memo is sent via email we will make that an agenda topic at the the top of our meeting uh, and September 30th along with a slide of what those bulleted requirements are we'll have discussion before moving forward but they might be important to have before we do our ranking because we are doing a ranking on that poll so I would say maybe along with the link, that document should be included. And then it can be a topic on the agenda, but I mean, if, if you're making some kind of initial ranking, you probably want to know what the city manager has made recommendations. Are you? Okay. It's definitely available at phoenix.gov slash bond, um, but we will make sure that the document, the link, is sent in advance of the survey tool being deployed to us. Um, sequencing is important, so making sure everyone has access to that memo. The survey um, tool will be deployed after um, an email is sent with the memo. And because we are not yet talking about, through the survey tool, the amounts, I think there's a level of comfort to deploy the survey tool before receiving via email the compiled detailed cost estimates for the projects that we'll then discuss in greater detail at our fourth meeting. Is everyone comfortable with that? An email with the city manager's recommended requirements, then the survey tool, and at least a, a few days in advance of our September 30th meeting we'll receive those compiled detailed cost estimates. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, if I, I can, just a couple points of clarification. First to Ms. Freeman's question about uh, criteria for the ranking purposes. The criteria that's identified in the city manager's memo was criteria that the city manager provided to departments for the purpose of identifying needs. There has not been criteria 
provided to committee members for your ranking purposes. It's, it's subjective on how you want to go about your personal ranking. So at our next meeting, we'll use those as a starting point for the discussion. Madam Chair, if I could, I know we're going to press for time to do public comment, but I think the intent of putting these subcommittees together was to gather a diverse group of voices that each bring their own backgrounds and understanding to the table to provide their own sort of subjective ranking criteria to get something that's as reflective of the city's population as possible. So I don't know that we need a committee-wide ranking criteria if that was the intent. I think that, that we all have experience in different ways probably serves us well in this, this way. I apologize. I'm not sure I follow the point that you're making. You do, we do not need what at this time? Uh, simply saying that I don't think we need a, com a subcommittee-wide agreed-upon ranking criteria that, that our individual criteria uh, that we can then discuss at the next meeting is probably sufficient. Look to other members of the committee for their comments. Madam Chair, I actually uh, agree with that. I don't necessarily feel like I need a committee-wide agreement as much as we've spent the last three meetings um, receiving presentations, receiving information, and being able to make that assessment based off of the information I've heard, the information provided by the city, and my experience with understanding the arts and culture venues in our city. Okay, no further comments or discussion. Um, Gretchen, do please bring those with you as just a discussion point at our fourth meeting. Um. These recommendations do not, I mean, it does not preclude our bringing our own backgrounds to the table. There are just some criteria about, um, well, I think it's pretty, <laughs> I'll give it to you and then you can decide if it, yeah. Excellent. Is that acceptable? Certainly from staff's perspective, uh, you know, that's fine. And if it's something that you would like to uh, provide to Mitch, we can email that out to everyone as part of the other background stuff so that you all have that in the interest of time. Excellent. Uh, Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the, of the subcommittee, I, I would like to clarify, I think, the potential motion that you, you put out there because what we want to make sure is that we're surveying what you want us to survey. Uh, and so I want to get clarity and make sure you're all, you're all good with that if, if you're ready for that at this point. So. I think what, what you guys want to survey is all the projects that are on the screen here uh, and the screen in, in front of you, um, and then include the um, Herberger Theater, both projects combined uh, in there, and then for the Children's Museum. No, not combined. Separately. Wait. The, the Herberger Theater project should be individ two separate projects, as they are listed. And the Children's Museum, I think, should be one project. Okay, well then, we need to, you're going to have the same problem we potentially talked about with the Children's Museum of diluting one. If you're going to survey two for one organization. No, they're I distinct projects. That. Yeah, they're two different projects. Yeah. So the Children's Museum has different levels of its expansion. So what I heard from you earlier was oh. that if we put in the breakdown of 1.4, 1.8, 5.3, we may dilute them in the ranking. So it is better for us to actually just put the organization in the survey. When it comes to the Herberger Theater, these are two separate projects, so we are ranking them in uh, priority needs of what we want to go forward versus putting them together as one. Correct. I apologize when we clarify. Apparently, the, the survey instrument can okay. do both. Just make sure that you're paying attention to which one is which when you're okay. when you're okay. ranking them on that. So you um, would rank it as theatrical and one as uh, pavilion, correct? Vice Chair Broughton, members of the subcommittee. Uh, yes, we will specify the two different projects. One will be listed as the pavilion improvements. The other will be listed as the theatrical improvements. Thank you. And then the Children's Museum would be listed with no cost, uh, and then also the Phoenix Center for the Arts would be listed, but no cost. That. So in other so words, we're listing. Can, can you? 
all three categories that we currently have. All of them. Uh, all three that are shown on the screen here, That's right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Th that is, uh, I believe, what uh, the chair put forward as a, as a possible motion. We, we do need this in the form of a, a motion and a second and a vote to make sure you guys are all, all good with that because that's going to be the basis for us to, to do the survey. And so I, I want to sure clarify that too, there are no costs associated, associated with any of the projects in the rank ordering by the tool, right? We're not dealing with, you said you leave the price out or the cost out for certain projects, but you're leaving them out for all of them, correct? Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, that, that is correct. Uh, if it's desired by the committee, we could include uh, something with the Children's Museum that essentially says the funding is yet to be determined. Um, just to kind of All of them it. have yet to be determined. Well, certainly the subcommittee has discretion to adjust the funding. That's correct. Um, I think our recommendation is to approach the ranking uh, based on the projects as defined, except in the unique situations where there are multiple scopes. <laughs> for the same organization. Just oh, Matt, because Matt, that, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Ms. just because that will help you figure out where there might be consensus and how much money might already be, if everyone agrees on one project, for instance, that is X amount of dollars, principally worth the, sur worth the survey, you'll know to take that one off. Uh, you're not bound by the ranking or the money that gets put out there as part of the survey. It just gives you a place to start some of that discussion. Yeah. With, my, with that, Madam Chair, can I motion to approve the survey as discussed? You may. Second. All in favor? Just to clarify, that would include the money that, for all except for the two that I mentioned, no, right? No. Or no. That would not include the money. And just to that point, uh, Gretchen, what I heard, um, Mr. Steven say is that putting the Children's Museum on there with no money allows us to just prioritize it as our rankings. Putting it on there with the breakdown of money may dilute the fact that it may be moved throughout. So what we want to do is just rank the projects, not be focused on the amount. That's right. True for all of the That's true for all of them, but I just wanted because for clarification is just to why I said that earlier. Right. Okay. I agree. Okay, but we understand. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I believe that concludes our discussion portion. It is 11:56. I will look to staff for direction in terms of public comment. Uh, I'm not the one who has a hard stop on the building. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I think we could go till 1210, so if we uh, wish to call some speakers. Let's get going. Excellent. I believe we have 16 signed up to speak. That's both virtually and in person. We'll take the, the virtual online speakers first, uh, and again, allotting a minute. If you'd like to donate your time to someone else, please indicate, and we will give that person uh, two full minutes. Uh, today we don't have any virtual speakers. Our first speaker will be Sarah Dow in Upper Council Chambers. I've not seen any movement. Our next speaker will be Tyler Service in Upper Council Chambers. Yes, I believe you said we do not have anyone online. Yes, we have no virtual. All the speakers are here in person. Our first speaker is Sarah Dow, if she wishes to speak. If not, our next speaker is Tyler Service. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the subcommittee. My name is Sarah Dial. I'll speak quickly. I'm a Phoenix resident. My business is here. I sit on the board of two public companies who have their um, headquarters here. Eight years ago, I was chairman of Valley Youth Theater when we began these discussions about what our permanent home will be, because as you've learned, we are being displaced by ASU. Um, I can't tell you why the staff came up with their recommendation and the amounts that they funded us, other than to say this is something we've been working on for eight years. This wasn't a proposal we submitted a couple months ago. This wasn't something we put together last week. This has been something we've been working very, very closely with two mayors, two city managers, 
and thank God we've had Chris Mackey for all of those eight years on this project. As a member of the board, I'm here on behalf of them, the business side of VYT. You heard it from our esteemed leader. Um, behind him is a group of professionals that are dedicated and committed to hopefully using these very, very precious city funds to leverage them into something you will be very proud of. Thank you. Our next speaker in the upper council chambers is Tyler Service, followed by Mark uh, Fury. Hello, Madam Chair and Committee. My name is Officer Tyler Service. I'm a veteran officer of the Chandler Police Department, and I'm also a Valley Youth Theater alumni. I grew up in Valley Youth Theater starting in 1996 when we were displaced in 98. I helped build our physical building that we have right now on First Street in Fillmore, and the thought of being displaced one more time is disparaging to me and the thousands of youth who have gone through Valley Youth Theater throughout the years. It is true that Valley Youth Theater has produced some very famous actors and actresses, but I'm here to tell you that the majority of these kids have, be have not become famous. We have gone on to be upstanding citizens in our communities. We are parents, educators, entrepreneurs, politicians, and police officers. Valley Youth Theater has been a force of good in the Valley for 30 years and is deserving of continued su support. They deserve a permanent place to call their home for the next generation of parents, educators, business owners, politicians, and police officers. Thank you for your consideration in this matter. Our next speaker is Mark Fury, followed by Olivia Fury. Good morning, Madam Chair and the Council. I'm grateful for the opportunity to come before you and just share a little bit with you. I am the music director for the Valley Youth Theater. I've been there for 26 years. In my mind, I'm still 26, but I'm 52. I have spent half my entire life working at the theater. And at this point in life, I'm starting to think along terms of a legacy and knowing that we would have a permanent home in place for the thousands of kids that are still coming through would bring me complete joy. You know about our programs. They, with the lack of arts that's happening in schools, we are trying to bridge some of the gap and provide fee-free programs for kids all over the valley. Being right here in Central Phoenix has been a joy for me, knowing that we are in the center of what's happening. Kids come to us from all over. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Olivia Fury, followed by Bob and Carol Cooper. Hello. Um, I would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to us speak about Value Theater's permanent home. Um, I have been a part of Value Theater since I was a baby because my dad would bring me to rehearsals and I performed in my first um, show there when I was five years old. And since then, I've done over a dozen shows with them. Um, being a part of VYT has taught me many valuable lessons that are useful in not only theater but also in everyday life. It's a joy to be a part of um, the organization as well as the many programs they have, like Hope Kids, which is um, something we do before the show opens. It's our final dress rehearsal and we perform for kids with chronic illnesses and diseases that can't come to normal shows and so they get to come to our dress rehearsal and have that special time just for them, which is really cool. It teaches, taught me about the importance of going out of your way to make sure others could have the same opportunities. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bob and Carol Cooper, followed by Katrina Collar. In interest of time, I just wanted to stand here for one more second and say thank you. You have a lot, I know you have a difficult task ahead of you. This is Carol Cooper. She has also been with Valley Youth Theater for 26 years, and the three of us, Mark, Carol, and I, have been that force of that positive energy for the children of our community to go on and be whatever they want to be because they believe in themselves, they've learned how to work hard, and they know what it takes to make an investment, and I hope you will make an investment in them. Thank you so very much. Much. Our next speaker is Katrina Collar, followed by Mark Metis. Madam Chair, subcommittee members, thank you so much for your service. Uh, my name is Katrina Kaler. I am president and CEO of ArtLink, and today I am here in my capacity as chair of Phoenix Community Alliance's Arts, Culture, and Public Life Committee. 
I am here to advocate on behalf of the membership uh, and the board of Phoenix Community Alliance. Phoenix Community Alliance advocates for all projects identified in the prioritized capital needs, future capital needs categories, as well as additional capital needs projects brought forth for GO bond funding and to increase funding for the arts beyond bond programs. You've asked many incisive questions today with continued trust of uh, Phoenix, City of Phoenix staff to provide information and answers to those questions. We hope to embolden you and to uh, readily recognize that none of the organizations or projects put forth are expendable. Every organization that you are reviewing is vital to this city and not just geographically to the downtown area, but to the entire city of Phoenix and its population. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Mark Mendes, followed by Sandra Bassett. Hello, I just want to thank you for all of your service for this important work that you're doing right now and remind you that the, the Pavilion Stage Project is for the future, it's for the community. We are actively committed to um, funding our portion of this and funding the ongoing uh, project and the operations of this and inviting the community to share in this important element for the future. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandra Bassett, followed by Kate Wells. You all have heard quite a bit from me, but I just wanted to reiterate a few things. One, we appreciate the support. We appreciate the partnerships. We appreciate the opportunity to serve the community with arts and culture. We look at ourselves as in our mission as the ones that eliminate entries to barrier into arts and culture participation, especially in our theater. So we hope that you will review our proposals for full consideration. Um, they're not nice to have. They're things that we just need to function because we can't replace light bulbs or anything anymore. And we we need the assistance so we don't get our feet caught in the floor from damage or that we can use the restrooms and the other fixtures in our building accordingly. The city deserves um, this. The community deserves this. And I hope that you will receive our updated and revised proposals. Anything else that's needed, we're here. We're ready to sit down and have the conversation together with Arts and Culture and Parks and Rec and bring back to you a program and a proposal that will hopefully be well received. Again, we thank you for the opportunity and most of all, it's Friday. Enjoy your weekend. Our next speaker is Kate Wells, followed by Allison Antu. Um, Allison's giving me her time, so two minutes, hopefully. Um, so um, in front of you, hopefully, is a, um, a supplement packet, supplement two, um, and it will clarify some of the questions you have and also illustrate why and how our project meets or exceeds every criteria that was put forward by um, the committee at the very first meeting. Um, to clarify really quick, I want to um, let you know that the proposed funds um, are to bring back all, all of our current rooms to code, abate the entire building, and have certificate of occupancies in 100% of the space and to bring all, all rooms up to white box standards. While we could do part of the project because of the scope of the needs, the way the building is laid out um, and other factors, it would be significantly more efficient and impactful to complete the entire project at one time. Of the 5.39 million we are requesting, this is 10% of the bonds fundings, but it will impact over 750,000 children in the first five years that we've been able to renovate this space. This is an addition to what we're already doing. Um, the uh, museum has a stellar track record in serving our diverse community. We have proven we can manage large, complex construction projects and turn money into magic. Our leadership team is solid, experienced, and has successfully navigated other major capital projects, COVID, and on top of this, we're running the day-to-day -day operations of one of the Arizona's most visitors, visited arts organizations. We have improved ability to raise additional millions of dollars to take the spaces that hopefully the city will renovate for us and then turn them into real public good. Um, in front of your packet, there's a letter from one of the CEOs of the largest philanthropic organization in our state, or one of them, the Steele Foundation. It's just one example of how major donors in our community are lining up to help the museum grow, but are put a pause on it until our building is, um, is finished. A direct quote from the letter from Marianne Mago, 
reads, our foundation has every expectation of remaining a valuable partner to the museum. However, any new investments and programs are best leveraged once basic renovations are complete. We are unable to direct any funds towards these renovations and rather encourage the city as owners of the building to bring the rooms up to code and occupancy standards. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Daniel, followed by Prince Murray. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and subcommittee members. My name is Chris Daniel, more notably known as Stone. I'm here to support the Phoenix Center of the Arts. I uh, actually was exposed to the arts community through the Phoenix Center of Arts, through what I'm actually now hosting. I'm also the chair of the Roosevelt Row Artists Advisory Council, so I represent visual and performing artists. And I just want to say that that facility, the Third Street Theater, is something that is so valuable. It's a treasure in our community that we need to, to uphold and truly hopefully you will take to consideration and make the renovations that necessary. I was looking at your can lights. I'm also in sound production and video and I think your can lights are more modern than the can lights that they use. I've been in production for more than 25 years and they still using the gel, color gel that you would have to actually physically go up to change the color. So there's definitely a need. There's cracks obviously uh, throughout the building as you ever heard. I'm not gonna reiterate what Sandra Bassett already shared with you but there's a number of needs that's within that particular theater from seating to, to lighting to sound system and so forth. So thank you for the opportunity and I hopefully you really seriously take the consideration to, to support and invest in the Phoenix Center of the Arts. Thank you. Our next speaker is Prince Murray followed by Rabbi Jeffrey Sherman. Okay, good afternoon, can you guys hear me? Well, thank you so much, um, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, member of the subcommittee, staff, uh, well, first of all, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you so much for giving the opportunity to come and speak. And I also want to applaud the work you guys are doing. Especially, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Alfredo Gutierrez. I've seen you so many times. And when I used to go to Maricopa, one of the community college in the district. So I want to applaud your leadership and the work you do in the community. So I want, to, I, I want that for the record to reflect that. Uh, as I said, my name is Prince, and I serve as the former president of the Librarian Association of Arizona. The reason I'm here today, I'm here on behalf of the Arizona Historical Jewish Society to be you know, able to support them on this um, initiative. And the reason I'm saying the work they are doing is very impressive because I'm from West Africa, Liberia, and I came from the country that I've been fighting 14 years of civil war. So, and I love the work they are doing in terms of providing education to the community to be able to talk about war, you know, uh, speak again, hit. So uh, I'm hoping that this uh, subcommittee will be able to accept um, that proposal. I'm sorry because of time, so I cannot go more into that. With that, you're the balance of my time to on the chair, the honorable chair lady. Our next speaker is Rabbi Jeffrey Shesnall, followed by Matthew Schaefer. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chairperson, uh, subcommittee, staff. Um, the Arizona Jewish Historical Society is pri primarily privately funding this project, uh, which will cost a total of $20 million, seeking the $2 million support from the bond. The uh, society is prepared to provide the city with the asset to satisfy the requirements of ownership as required. So that is something we are working with the city on already. Um, this is a learning center for not only for the Holocaust, for, for all, gener all kinds of genocides and so forth. The important thing here is that this is gonna generate a lot of tourism for the city. On an average, each year, $138,000 in uh, economic impact on the city, over $4 million over the life of the bond issue. Over a, mi over a million people will come and visit, and all the supporting data is in a packet I've left for you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Matthew Schaefer, followed by Michael Bernard. Hello. Uh, thank you all again for your service and for your consideration of the Phoenix Theater Project. Um, it's, it's really appreciated, sincerely. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate that the proposed project um, for building the addition onto our building 
was validated by the city as the most cost-efficient way of dealing with the back-of-house access problems at the theater. Um, I had heard some confusion about that earlier, so I just wanted to clarify that. And in addition, I wanted to say that we did validate that uh, $5.8 million cost with our contractor just last week, so those numbers are, um, fr are fresh. Those are, those are not real numbers. Um, so thank you again for your consideration. Our final speaker is Michael Bernard. <clears throat> Madam Chair and subcommittee, um, thank you very much. And uh, City of Phoenix employees, uh, I appreciate our time. Uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I just want to thank you all very much for considering um, this part of inclusivity for our um, theater, which is um, for those who are mo mobile challenged in one way or another, um, and that it is a basic need. Um, we are finding that there are more and more individuals in this new normal that we live in that are seeking to participate, to, be, to belong, <coughs> to be out uh, in the world, and to um, show off their talents. And this is a, a way that we can uh, do that for this particular population. So. Uh, I thank you for your consideration and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Madam Chair, that was our final speaker. Thank you. I believe we've outlined future agenda items previously, unless anyone has anything else to add to that list. Otherwise, I will go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you. the country and more than 250 miles of trails, there's always an opportunity to escape. South Mountain, the second largest city park in the country, alone offers more than 120 miles of trails for hiking, biking, and horseback riding. More than 1,000 miles of bike paths and bike lanes. And there's lots of golf. There are so many ways to escape in Phoenix. Award-winning dining, our coffee and